Uh, welcome to Bangkok. Um, good morning. My name is Makoto Kato. I'm a head of the um, uh, uh, Secretariat of um, Initiative of Low Carbon Lifecycle Management, or IFL, uh, hosted by the Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center, Japan. I would like to um, um, start uh, this meeting uh, by inviting um, our uh, colleagues um, uh, from the uh, Japanese government, Asian Development Bank, and also uh, the Royal Government of Thailand. Uh, first, um, I would like to invite uh, Hide Tomo Miyake, uh, who is from the Office of Low Carbon Control Policy, uh, Climate Change Policy Division, uh, Ministry of the Environment, Japan. Miyake san, you have the floor. Good morning, Saudi Club. I'm Hideto Miyake from the Ministry of the Environment, Japan. I'm delighted to welcome you to the group seminar for Asian countries for, for Carbon Life Cycle Management 2024. Since the establishment of the Initiative for, for Carbon Life Cycle Management in, 19, in, oh, in 2019, we have been promoting life cycle refrigerant management with partner countries and organizations. These collaborative efforts will contribute to the goals set by both Kigali Amendment and the Paris Agreement. Thanks to our partners, the concept of refrigerant life cycle management has attracted more attention. One of the highlights internationally is that MOF 35, the Montreal Protocol in Nairobi, adopted Edition 11 on LRM. At MOP 6 in Bangkok in October, a workshop life cycle refrigerant management will be held. Toward further activities, including the workshop at MOP 6, today we'll be sharing information, experiences, and lessons learned from countries and organizations. Topics vary from current status of LRM, resolution, technologies, the TIP report and market mechanisms, and so on. We appreciate today's group seminar being supported by all of you, in particular, strong part partners of the Asian Development Bank and the Climate and Green Air Coalitions. With the generous contributions, the group seminar has been scaled up in terms of participation as well as technical and knowledge resources. On behalf of the government of Japan, I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to them. I'm looking forward to everyone's activity, participation in discussions. Please enjoy the two days of activity in Bangkok. Thank you, Kopu Club. Thank you very much. Um, now, I would like to invite Mr. Anuj uh, Mehta, who is the country director, um, Asian Development Bank, uh, Thailand uh, Residence Mission. Please. Good morning. Good to see a packed room on such an important issue. Uh, so welcome to those of you who are coming from outside Thailand. And, you know, nice to see a lot of you who are already here and who I know from before. For those of you who I don't know, uh, Anuj Mercer is me. Uh, I'm the head of the ADB office in Thailand. Been here about three years. Um, used to be in the Manila office, India before that, China, lots of different experiences. So about 20 years now at ADB. Um, good to see you. But, you know, let me start with, I think, a warm welcome, firstly, to our colleagues from DCC, Khun Savach. Great to see you. Sawadeha, welcome. Uh, great to see you, Hede Tomok San. Great to see you over here. I think first time we've met, but it's it's good to see the partnership between ADB and Ministry of Environment, and of course DCCE growing. Um, Nathan, who I haven't yet met from the United Nations EP CCAC uh, group, uh, distinguished guest, esteemed colleagues. Um, it's great pleasure um, and honor actually that I welcome you all to this seminar on fluorocarbons life cycle management. 
I think you know. I think the the issue of the climate crisis as a as a context is is so visible, um, especially over the last I think eight nine years. Um, even you know, sort of you know, as we speak right now, the issue of floods is is such an important visible issue that we're seeing in Thailand, in Bangladesh, in India. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing droughts. Um, I know in 2024, we've already seen some of the hottest temperatures already in northern Thailand. I think it was in Lampang province, 44.2 degrees. Probably the all-time high was about 44.6. So visible impacts of climate change are everywhere and, um, and escalating. Um, ADB sets itself out to be uh, the climate bank for Asia and the Pacific. We recognize that we've got a super important role, not just in, in finance, but also in technical solutions, which can focus on often underserved issues, sometimes like the hydrofluorocarbon issue. Um, ADB set up its, its target of, uh, of catalyzing or financing about $100 billion cumulatively just from ADB itself by 2030. Uh, but of course, that's also meant to catalyze a multiple of finances from other sources. I know in our own office in Thailand, we've been working with the government of Thailand on green bonds to accelerate a lot more financing from capital markets. Some multiple is astonishing. So the, the importance of leveraging development bank and government funding to catalyze private capital in, into important issues for climate change is, is, is critical. You know, on the issue of HFC, I, I keep hearing several people refer to it as a super greenhouse gas uh, impact. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm stunned to see the, the, the impact of HFCs, you know, they say 2% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but impacts in terms of hundreds or thousands of times more than carbon dioxide. So, you know, it's, it's critical. ADB has been focused on addressing a range of uh, high global uh, warming potential greenhouse gases other than CO2. Um, HFCs, um, which are meant to be controlled under the Kigai uh, Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, uh, is, is, of course, super potent, um, huge global warming potential, uh, and therefore critical to reduce HFCs emissions if we want to be clear and, and, and really trying to reduce the, the tipping points which we are going to get as the, as the temperature rises, um, critical to achieving the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Um, as a founding member of the initiative on fluorocarbon uh, life cycle management, which was launched by MOEJ uh, at COP25, ADB remains steadfast in supporting our DMCs, our developing member countries, in promoting life cycle management of fluorocarbons. Um, at the Kigali Amendment, of course, uh, to the Montreal Protocol that seeks to phase down HFCs, many of our nations are already begin, you know, doing this. There's already... Uh, a commencement of uh, changes uh, to management of HFCs. But of course, it is essential that we also leverage market-based solutions. So we come to carbon markets. And carbon markets is, is part of the global or the broader climate policy architecture, which can provide or support cost-effective HFC emissions reduction. Um, you know, the way I see uh, carbon markets is especially as an incentive mechanism, which incentivizes both the flow of funding investments from the private sector by improving the bankability uh, numbers, but also by catalyzing the diffusion of technologies, low carbon technologies. So carbon markets are critical. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at carbon markets for uh, also for biodiversity, but I think also for HFCs. ADB has its own carbon market program, the CMP, uh, long-standing engagement with carbon finance, carbon markets. We talk to a lot of institutional investors to bring their financing in as a vehicle or as a channel. Um, and the, the CMP, the ADB Carbon Market Program, provides access to carbon finance both to catalyze investments in low-carbon technologies and solutions, but it does it in, in, a, in a very nice programmatic way. You know, we do upstream stuff, which is upstream, midstream, and downstream support. So this is technical assistance for carbon market development, an issue that we are, you know, even now we have a team looking at a number of private sector companies and helping them develop their carbon uh, market uh, mechanisms, but also with, with the public sector. So we have that upstream support to develop the mechanism. And then downstream, we actually mobilize the funding um, from international markets into, into, into investments. So both TA as well as investment, if you like. Um, a dedicated TA team um, works on, on life cycle management, which is also supporting the development of today's seminar. 
So, you know, we have all the tools available to really bring a focus uh, to the to the issue. And along with our development partners, including, of course, MOEJ, uh, UNEP, and of course, for me, the Thailand DCCE, uh, we are supporting countries promote both knowledge, capacity, and of course, uh, you know, project uh, project frameworks mechanisms. So sort of a nice multi-pronged approach. Today's seminar marks a crucial step in our collective efforts to foster sustainable development and strengthen regional cooperation. You know, we are often asked, how do you tackle the issue of heat or HFCs or, or air? You can't do it alone. It cannot be done by any single country. So regional approach is, is critical. And, you know, sitting in Thailand, I often see regional approaches to a number of issues with our ASEAN neighbors. Uh, ADB, in collaboration with our key partners, is therefore delighted to lay the groundwork for innovative solutions that will not only mitigate the environmental impact of HSEs, but also promote energy-efficient technologies and contribute to sustainable development, the goal of all of us, I think, over here. I hope that this platform, that the event today will serve a useful platform for learning, collaboration. I'm already thinking of you know, setting up a collaboration with MOEJ for a global initiative, so I already see the value here. But I hope a lot of you take um, you know, a lot of knowledge away from here and come back to us with ideas and, and things that we should do even further. Good luck for the event, and hopefully we have some fruitful discussions today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fantastic um, speech, uh, Mr. Anush. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Schwartz, uh, uh, Gang Charun, um, uh, he's the director of uh, the Office of uh, Climate Change Mitigation Division and uh, uh, Department of Climate Change and Environment, DCCE, uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Environment, Thailand. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Siwat Kajalan. Uh, Director of Climate Change Mitigation Division uh, on behalf of uh, the Department of Climate Change and Environment, uh, or DCCE, and the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Environment, Thailand. And greeting uh, Dr. Uh, Hidemoto uh, Miyake, uh, Deputy De Director, uh, Office of Flora Carbon Control Policy, uh, Ministry of uh, the Environment, uh, Government of Japan. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Anush Mehta, uh, Country Director uh, of uh, uh, Thailand uh, Resident Mission, uh, ADB, uh, and uh, distinguished uh, representative and uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, to join uh, this meeting. Uh, welcome to uh, Thailand. Uh, uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to intend uh, a very warm welcome uh, to all participants to the group seminar for ASEAN country on uh, for carbon life cycle uh, management 2024. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere uh, gratitude to ADB for your uh, uh, dedication in, uh, in co-organizing this uh, meeting. Uh, as you are aware, uh, Thailand and um, MOJ have a good uh, relationship uh, in many areas, uh, especially uh, the cooperation in uh, climate change and environment, and the contribute uh, effort both in uh, mitigation and uh, adaptation as uh, significant uh, driving uh, the progress of uh, climate action in Thailand. Uh, as uh, the loyal Thai government uh, is working hard on uh, its economic growth, uh, climate change is also prioritized among uh, its top uh, national uh, agendas. Uh, as you are aware, uh, for carbon uh, a group of uh, compound uh, containing uh, for line and uh, carbon used in daily uh, consumer products, uh, such as uh, aerosol, uh, propylene, uh, refrigerant, uh, nostic coating, uh, electrical uh, insulation and fly uh, detailing form. Uh, hydrofluorocarbon uh, uh, widely uh, used uh, in the cooling sector uh, represent 2% uh, two, two of the total global emission and uh, increase uh, use at 10% uh, per year with uh, each share of uh, global emission uh, projects 
to rise uh, to nine to nineteen percent of uh, total global carbon dioxide equivalent by two thousand fifty. Uh, in October uh, two thousand sixteen. Uh, country agree to include uh, hydrofluorocarbon in uh, the list of uh, controlled uh, substance and ensure climate uh, reduction uh, by 80 to 85 percent by 2050 under uh, Gigli Amendment uh, to Montreal Protocol with uh, two efforts at uh, January 2019. Uh, Thailand has had great importance to the global effort uh, to address this common and present, uh, pressing uh, challenge. Uh, Thailand enhance its first nationally determined uh, uh, contribute or NDC at the COP26 uh, to fulfill uh, the long-term uh, temperature goal set uh, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, Thailand intend to reduce is uh, greenhouse gas emission by uh, 30 uh, to uh, 40 uh, percent from the BAU level by uh, 2030. Uh, for the domestic uh, implementation at the level uh, of uh, contribution could increase up to uh, 40 percent. Uh, subject to adequate uh, and enhanced Asset to uh, technology uh, development and transfer financial resource and capacity building uh, uh, support. Uh, furthermore, Thailand will uh, continue uh, we we uh, effort in its challenge to meet uh, the long term goal of uh, carbon neutral uh, by two thousand fifty and a zero greenhouse gas uh, emission by two thousand sixty five. Uh, the life cycle management uh, of uh, refrigerant is uh, included in NDC 2030 uh, in the industrial uh, sector. Uh, for the next year, we, uh, uh, we will uh, submit NDC uh, 3.0 or new uh, target uh, to unit uh, In addition uh, to our uh, step to uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, development, we are in the process uh, for, of uh, formulating uh, the Climate Change Act. Uh, the aim is to increase the efficiency uh, of uh, climate action in Thailand uh, across uh, environmental, uh, economy, uh, social, uh, safety, and health uh, dimension. Uh, this uh, prospect uh, acts. Uh, would create great uh, opportunity for uh, stakeholders from all parts uh, of the society to play key role in uh, implementation. Uh, Thailand uh, climate action uh, will considering a uh, long-term adaptation to uh, climate change as well as uh, promote sustainable uh, development. Uh, lastly, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the uh, very hard work uh, of uh, everyone who has been uh, released uh, Leslie uh, put uh, to make our role uh, and better the uh, better uh, place for the people and our younger generation. Uh, I hope all of you uh, stay safe and uh, remain healthy uh, and healthy. Uh, uh, during this uh, situation, uh, we are uh, generating uh, the wonderful uh, contribution. I wish you a really successful uh, meeting and fulfill uh, uh, devotion uh, and exchanging. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gun uh, Shuat. Um, really appreciate for the leadership of uh, the Royal Government of Thailand. Um, um, I'm very glad to uh, inform you that, well, like from, of course, well, we have like 75 uh, participants in this meeting uh, today, but uh, uh, especially well, from the uh, from Thailand, uh, including for the Department of Climate Change, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, and also the uh, Department of um, 
uh, industrial work uh, of uh, yeah, Ministry of Inv uh, Ministry of Industry and Bangkok Metropolitan Administration BMA and Academia Private Sector. Well, there are a lot of uh, participants from Thailand, so that you can also uh, learn from um, um, and exchange uh, and and discuss with for Thai people because well, it's it it is a, a very powerful uh, country for us to work with. Yep, and now. Um, uh, we are going to walk you through um, the uh, the background of this um, Asia Group Seminar 2024. And also, like, uh, uh, we are going to contextualize, like, what we are um, discussing for the for today and tomorrow's uh, discussion. For this presentation, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sayuri Eshijo. Uh, she's a researcher of the Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center. Uh, and also, I am going to join her uh, for the presentation. So, please, some please. Good morning. Hope I'm Sayuri Shijo, an Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center, Japan. Please call us OECC. I'm I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our co-organizer, uh, Climate and Clean Air uh, Coalition, CCAC, and Asian Development Bank, ADB. I believe it will uh, be extremely meaningful to discuss with CCAC and ADB issue, uh, Asian country facing the coal in sector and the climate change. And we would like to thank them for their cooperation. I would like to introduce the background. Sorry. Sorry. I would like to briefly touch upon why we should work on a life cycle management. As we know, the Montreal Protocol basically focuses on the regulation on production and consumption of ODS and HFCs. There are so-called upstream part of the life cycle of refrigerant. As to the middle to downstream of the refrigerant management, such as a recovery, a meaning collection of used refrigerant from calling equipment, uh, reclamation, meaning clean up of refrigerant for the second use, and recycle and destruction. By treating this way, we can avoid very powerful greenhouse gases from being released into the atmosphere. For this kind of action, the Montreal Protocol does not oblige the parties, but only encourage them to take their own step in their domestic administration. But in most developed countries, they are currently vented uh, refrigerant into the atmosphere due to the lock of policy and the regulatory framework, as well as resources. What we see on the screen are quotes from the famous IEA report of filter of cooling. The number of air conditioner stock worldwide is expected to briefly triple by 2050, driven by the economic growth and in for climate change mitigation benefit, there is a three pillar of action. The first one is promote energy efficient cooling equipment by reducing energy consumption per unit of cooling equipment while reduce electricity demand. The second is uh, to save to low and non-GWP refrigerants so that in the event of releasing a refrigerant into the atmosphere, if the total global warming potential is lower, we can mitigate climate change. The third one is uh, implement life cycle refrigerant management, including avoiding leakage, recovery, recycle, reclamation, and the destruction of refrigerant. According to EIA, 
I. DSD and NRDC, the total amount of fluorocarbons already in circulation and those not yet sold under the global HFC phrase then will reach 19 billion tons of CO2 equivalent globally by 2100. A strong LRM regime could prevent emission of about 61 billion ton of CO2 of ODS and HFC expect to be used by the 2050. Of course, during the discussion of COP28 in Dubai, there are many approaches and the regulatory framework is recommended for the climate change. Uh, LRM is one of the effective contribution to the mitigation. COP28 in Dubai further confirmed the needs for the significant, uh, significant rapid and sustained DAG reduction to achieve the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming to 1.50 degree. In a section, uh, uh, according to the father, we recognize eight global efforts were set, and I would like to introduce two of them today. One is a uh, triple global renewable energy capacity and double of the double the global uh, uh, available annual rate of energy efficiency improvement by 2030, and the other F accelerate and significant reduce and non carbon dioxide emission, especially methane emission by 2030. This lays directly to the importance of reduction of show living climate pollutants. It is so-called SLCP, including HFCs. Under the COP28 presidency initiative, the global cooling pledge was declared by governments, private sector, and other to accelerate, accelerate cooling action. The pledge calls on the country to take on an integrated step to reduce the HG emission related to cooling equipment. The global cooling pledge is one of the key outcome of COP28 and it has been endorsed by the 71 countries around the world, including Japan. Countries that sign the pledge are required to achieve the following goals, reflecting different national circumstances. And I would like to put an emphasis on the life cycle management of flower carbon is included in this action. Now I would like to update OAWG 46 holding in Montreal uh, 8 to 11, uh, 12 July this year. The policy and the guideline on our LRM should be formulated on scientific knowledge and data. In OAWG 46 meeting, many discuss on LRM were developed based on a scientific and technological work complied by a team and SAP, which was requ requested by the uh, decision of MOP 35 in Nairobi. Okay, now let's remind four requests that are decided on the decisions 3511 regarding LRM. One of them is exactly what I would share with you all today. And this uh, we will come the tip number, Mr. Hilde Gant. We, he would introduce the tip report in this evening today, which was also shared in our D46. Okay, now Mr. Kato introduced the IFL work planned this year. So with a nice background of the um, um, Montreal Protocol context and also the Paris Agreement context, but we are actually walking you through um, the, uh, our work plan on IFL uh, today. So IFL um, has been 
uh, established uh, by the uh, Ministry of the Environment Japan. Um, and uh, uh, we have uh, several countries and international um, agencies who are joined. Uh, recently, uh, this year, uh, Republic of Moldova actually joined well, in our uh, uh, group, and we're uh, promoting um, um, life cycle refrigerant management well, uh, in many uh, different layers. Um, basically, what well, we have uh, work programs, uh, uh, including for well, mitigation, ambition, and transparency, uh, legislation and policy development, national development and investment support, and outreach and awareness raising. So these are sort of like our cooperation programs. So if you're interested, well, um, please uh, join us for, for this work. Um, for the climate change mitigation adaptation, um, uh, actually, well, uh, what is very interesting is that uh, uh, Kun uh, from the Department of Climate Change and Environment uh, of Thailand, well, he clearly mentioned like um, we're at the at this moment, well, um, in the uh, uh, we have a great momentum to uh, submit um, national determined contribution uh, 3.0. Uh, which is actually well the uh, invitation for all the um, Paris Agreement parties uh, to uh, update for their um, NDCs uh, mitigation commitment from 2025 to 2035. And then uh, as uh, Sayuri Sam mentioned, well, um, one of the sort of like uh, uh, low hanging fruits or like the easiest uh, point is like a L SLD um, CP, methane, um, N2O, um, um, SF6 and also um, um, HFC at this point of time. So that the uh, in our group, we, we have a guidelines and also we have um, capacity development um, support uh, for how to uh, update um, um, uh, mitigation um, um, ambitions for um, through reduction of um, HFCs. Also um, for the GHG counting for um, HFC inventory is extremely important. We've been uh, working um, very uh, powerfully with, uh, for example, the Republic of Indonesia, and that they have been uh, uh, closely working with us well, in developing their national greenhouse gas inventory, including well, HFCs. And for the legislation and policy development, uh, we always quote for the great work by the uh, Republic of um, uh, Socialist Republic of um, Vietnam. Vietnam um, has been very successful in um, updating uh, their revised environmental protection law, as well as degree number six. Well, this includes for well, mandatory reporting, uh, greenhouse gas reporting system, um, emissions trading system, as well as um, ozone layer protection and life cycle refrigerant management. And then they are actually moving forward for including for the um, HFC tracking system. In this afternoon, um, Mr. Ashish uh, from Gemba Next and also OECC myself, uh, we are going to um, share uh, the most recent updates of the um, uh, HFC tracking uh, support program uh, uh, supported by the CCAC. And also capacity development, um, manuals and guidelines, um, technical experts, um, training uh, for policymakers, and also study visits to Japan. Well, these are actually, um, we are going to tailor made um, depending on your um, um, interest and uh, or needs. And also, uh, we have been conducting um, lots of communications and dialogues so between um, uh, different parties and also uh, private sector people. And this is actually one well, of the pictures from last year. We actually visited uh, uh, Iwatani's uh, uh, factory, uh, suburban of Bangkok, and also on um, Tasco Thailand. Uh, colleagues, well, they, they kindly uh, uh, supported for organizing this um, uh, training uh, session for, for us, actually. And on your right-hand side, well, this is um, uh, the picture from Cambodia. Uh, also, um, Tasco Thailand, oh, sorry, Tasco uh, Osaka headquarters, um, they uh, actually help us um, bring in for the actual um, cylinders and also the uh, recovery machines. And we demonstrated for this uh, kind of work. And then this was a very uh, 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 good uh, training, and the people really liked that. Now, um, investment on um, life, cycle, life cycle refrigerant management. Of course, um, capacity development and uh, developmental legal um, um, uh, legal uh, framework, that's important. But also we are very much interested in investing on um, infrastructure. As uh, my colleague from the ADB said, 
for bringing finance is very important, bringing uh, actual um, hardware, not only software, so that the combination of um, hardware and software, that's something we're actually working on. And then for, 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 for that purpose, so we are actually using a joint crediting mechanism or JCM, which is um, uh, one of the uh, mechanisms under the um, Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. So that the um, this is um, uh, these four um, projects are actually a past project for that the Ministry of the Environment Japan selected as a model project. But for this fiscal year, we we hear we are going to have more uh, projects well, that are applied uh, for the support by the government government of Japan. And I think well, the uh, our ministry is now uh, in the process of selecting a new uh, project to be supported. And uh, for the uh, carbon markets, well, um, in this uh, uh, meeting tomorrow, actually, tomorrow morning, we're going to uh, uh, study more about well, how we're going to utilize um, uh, carbon, utilization of carbon market. Um, there are many pros and cons, and I, I believe that we, we really need to focus on integrity of um, this work. But one thing is that we don't have um, incentives uh, for uh, people to collect, recover, and um, destroy um, use um, uh, refrigerants. Baseline is actually well, we are simply venting well this very powerful greenhouse gases or ODS to the atmosphere. So we really have to do this. And one of the approach, not not everything, but the one of the approach, maybe well our utilization of um, our carbon credit revenue for to um, 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 provide um, incentive uh, for those who are really working on, on this issue. And then um, we're going to have uh, uh, outreach awareness ra uh, raising um, 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 event. I think I will um, outcome of this, uh, this uh, workshop, uh, this seminar today and tomorrow, we, uh, we are going to um, share, uh, well, uh, this part of this discussion probably in Montreal, or oh, sorry, in the Montreal Protocol MOP, which is going to be held uh, in October in Bangkok, but also uh, in Baku, uh, 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 COP29 is going to be organized so that the, we have another opportunity to share your voices, um, your wisdom onto the world. And, uh, and then I hope we'll, um, this will even accelerate our um, global efforts uh, to uh, address climate change and also yes, um, um, ozone layer protection issue. Then um, uh, with the uh, uh, great help by the CCAC, we have uh, uh, established for the um, uh, some manuals and uh, good practices. And this is kind of like a catalog uh, uh, of good practices uh, uh, policy for policymakers resource book. So if you are interested, please uh, have a look at uh, this. Well, you have many different um, cases. Uh, not only from uh, developed country parties, but also many developing countries, um, which are uh, very useful. And I hope uh, today uh, we're going to um, um, uh, stimulate our uh, uh, collaboration uh, by having updates uh, uh, from different countries uh, in this morning. And also we share the progress uh, of uh, uh, ADB's TA because well, this uh, uh, group seminar serves to um, uh, uh, be uh, the uh, sort of like a final uh, reporting uh, session uh, of the uh, uh, TA uh, conducted by the ADB. And also like uh, um, as I mentioned already, uh, we're going to listen to um, Ms. Hilde Don's <laughs> speech. Uh, 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 she's actually uh, representing like a TEEP um, task force member. Uh, uh, on our uh, life cycle refrigerant management. And also technologies um, applicable to right, uh, life cycle refrigerant management. And also we talk about domestic policies. Then on um, tomorrow morning, we are going to have life cycle refrigerant management and on um, carbon credit and mechanisms. Tomorrow afternoon, we have a, we have a time to go to a supermarket for shopping, but also like we would like to see how uh, refrigerants um, uh, leakage detection and also leakage prevention is very important. So that the uh, 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 um, our colleagues uh, actually Nambasan here, 
Yes. Uh, yeah, well, they kindly um, uh, coordinated with the local partners. And then uh, we are going to uh, have a look at what, how um, this uh, 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 refrigerant uh, leakage detector uh, is used for, to prevent uh, in the supermarket. And then this is kind of like, a, you know, applicable to all of your cases. You, you love supermarket, right? I love supermarkets, so that yeah, I hope well, this is um, some uh, good opportunity for, for, for you to um, consider. Um, um, maybe, well, this is, is something where we can start. Uh, it's a very small step. Yeah. But anyway, so this is something we're going to uh, uh, do this. Uh, and I hope well, you will enjoy uh, 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 these two entire uh, 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 day um, discussing with your colleagues, uh, making friends and making networks. Thank you very much for your for your attention. So um, this is the the opening session. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, for those who provided for the inputs uh, in the opening uh, remarks. And now uh, we would like to uh, invite all of you to uh, go to uh, uh, actually patio uh, for uh, taking a um, group photo. Then uh, we actually break uh, for for uh, coffee. Uh, we're uh, diving um, into the substantive part of uh, this seminar. Uh, we're going to have updates uh, on the progress of life cycle refrigerant management um, and challenges and opportunities for in uh, in different countries. And well, we have uh, several uh, country presentations um, in the beginning. And uh, here uh, we have, as the first speaker, we have uh, Cambodia, Mr. Im uh, Raksmi uh, from the Ministry of Environment. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Raksmi, please. Um, for, for you to speak um, um, at, at the podium, well, you can use for this um, uh, stick type uh, laser pointer you have. You can, you can, you can use this for, for um, uh, uh, advancing slides. Yeah, so. Um, in some please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Gato. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mai. I'm from the Ministry of Environment, Cambodia. Today, I would like to uh, give a brief information on the overview of fluoro fluoro life cycle management in Cambodia. <clears throat> so my presentation will start with the uh, so my presentation will start with the implement, implementation of the Montreal Protocol and uh, uh, Paris Agreement. And then uh, we are going to the cooperation activity in IFL during uh, 2023 and 2024. And the support activity under the Montreal Protocol and the step forward and the capacity building. It. Yeah, let's move to the implementation of the Montreal Protocol. So, in this point, <clears throat> Cambodia has demonstrated a strong commitment to Montreal Protocol, <clears throat> evident by its uh, successful implementation of the various measures to pace down also depletion substances. And the country has uh, made a significant <clears throat> strict in reducing its consumption and production as harmful chemicals like as uh, CSC and uh, hydrofluorocarbon. <clears throat> and these are the key achievements. We, uh, Cambodia has complete eliminated el elimination of uh, CSC and a significant reduction in HCFC. So uh, as an update in 2022-23, yeah, Cambodia has achieved almost 60% reduction in uh, HCFC. So in the, as in the plan, in 2025, we, 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 we hope we will reach the, the, the target in uh, on uh, in reduction of 60, 67.5 reduction, yeah, compared to the base year. And uh, we now uh, implementing the HSC reduction plan 
uh, and this plan already uh, produced. Yeah. And in, and in this 2024, we will, uh, it's the year to, 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 about 20 or 10 percent, yeah, of HCFC. And under the Montreal Protocol, uh, Cambodia implementing the uh, some legal framework, uh, such as the subdegree of what is when on the ozone depletion substances that adopted in 2005 is a, a legal instrument to control all ODS import and export and it uh, movement in the local market. And uh, nowadays, Ministry of Cambodia, Ministry of Environment Cambodia uh, has implemented the online license yeah, system for processing the import, export of ozone depletion substances and uh, the equipment that uh, use uh, ODS. And uh, since 2020, the system was linked to the national window. National window that this action will help the ministry to work more efficiently and effectively to in order to control the illegal trading. And we have the sub degree uh, 17 on the enforcement of list of prohibited and restricted goods that uh, the ODS and uh, AST was included in, in the sub degree as well. Yeah. And in another sub degree is uh, the sub degree of uh, 192 that was the revising of the sub degree of Participant and this sub degree will include the HSC into into the the the, the plan to pass out pass out yeah. yeah. So uh, move on to the cooperation activity in IFL during uh, the year two thousand twenty three and two thousand twenty four. At the support and the cooperation from the Ministry of Environment Japan and from uh, OCCC, uh, Cambodia has conducted the one online training during 2023 and two, two uh, offline training in 2023 as well. And the one is uh, was conducted in 2024 during, I mean, during. February, I think. Uh, and this training was uh, focusing on, yeah, can you move to the next one? Was focused on the guideline for the recovery of fluorocarbon and the guideline for destruction of fluorocarbon by uh, the expert from Japan. <clears throat> and the practical training of leakage uh, prevention, recovery, and uh, de destruction. And another one was we uh, during the training we introduced the technical point for the life cycle management of fluoride compound as well. Yeah, as you can see in the picture. Yeah, I think uh, some picture was shown by uh, Mr. Kato as well. Yeah. And in this uh, cooperation activity, Cambodia is going to formulate the law and the uh, regulation related to uh, life cycle management. And in order to successful this uh, formulation, we have three steps. Firstly, is uh, going to review the existing law and the regulation related to the fluoride management in Cambodia. And then we are going to analyze the, the necessary for implementation a life cycle management uh, framework for fluoride and drawing 
from uh, Japan and Vietnam for the for the guideline, yeah. And and then we're going to examine foreign uh, regulation, especially from uh, Japan and Vietnam for the operational guideline registration system and business uh, practice related to uh, flow rate about management, uh, flow rate about life cycle management in order to formulate as a sub-degree for, for Cambodia, yeah. Because now we have the, another sub-degree, but no sub-degree that uh, state about the, 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 the life cycle management of fluoro bond yet, yeah. So in the cooperation, we will formulate this sub-degree. And these are so about the support activity under the Montreal Protocol. So, uh, Every year, Ministry of Cambodia uh, was conducting the training for the technician on the gold practice for installation, preparing and uh, maintenance, calling equipment for the local and overseas as well. And uh, at least five, five training were conducted every year, yeah. And we are now implementing the, the quickly implementation plan and uh, we also has a small activity small activity like uh, labeling on the container of the ODS so when the the company export the the substance they have to add the label from from the ministry so we do this in order to uh, to in, to make sure that this uh, substance that is part is illegal yeah and permit by the ministry yeah so for the step forward and the capacity building need, so the MOE will uh, going to provide, continue to provide the capacity building for the local look technician on the good practice, yeah. And for installation, maintenance, and repairing of the calling equipment, and promote the recovery, recycling, and uh, reclaim of refrigerant and uh, to strengthen the implementation of the online license which linked with the national window and to organize the awareness raising uh, including on on the world ozone day so every year during o ozone ozone day Cambodia all uh always conduct the awareness raising especially to the uh, to the public and to the student, yeah. And to work closely with the uh, MOEJ and uh, OECC <clears throat> and other stakeholders on capacity building for the officer. So we, we see that the need for the officer like the policy uh, development and implementation, like uh, the policy formulation, enforcement, mechanism and incentive uh, uh, incentive structure so it's a need for the officer for the government officer and for the uh, also for the technician yeah for the technician is uh, we are focusing on the technical technology equipment for recycling uh, reclaim and this destruction of fluoro carbon so from the previous training uh, the feedback from the the participant, they offer the on, offline training is more preferable, yeah, because it's more practical, more practicable than online, yeah. So I think it's all for me, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for the nice presentation. Um, Cambodia is one of the leading uh, members of the IFL. Uh, we would like to keep uh, our uh, questions well until the end uh, for the uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Um, um, Raksmi. Now I would like to invite uh, Malaysia, uh, Ms. Amy A. Hwan. Here? Hi, oh, Amy here. And uh, also, uh, uh, Mr. Siti uh, Abdullah, uh, together with 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 her. Uh, thank you very much.
<laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Even though I haven't started my speech. <laughs> Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, and to share uh, the Malaysia experience uh, in the Montreal Protocol and also the IFL. Okay, so the current status of uh, implementation of, Mon of Montreal Protocol in Malaysia is uh, for HPMP3, uh, HPMP actually we are going into the stage three. Um, our uh, fund uh, was just approved in the 94th uh, ex committee. So for this, the third stage, um, we are going to do the total phase out, which is um, starting from this year until 2030. Um, for the Kigali implementation plan, um, we, are, we have actually started this year. Um, um, our fund was approved in the 93rd XCOM meeting and, and the um, our commitment was to um, to reduce 10% of the baseline, which is uh, 2.67 million tons CO2 equivalent uh, of reduction. Uh, reduction. So this year, uh, starting from 1st January uh, 2024, we have started our quota system for HFC um, and uh, I can say that it is a very challenging procedure given that HFC is um, 10 times a lot more than um, HCFC so it's a very complicated and very challenging uh, test for us. Okay, uh, our cooperation and activities in uh, uh, initiative of Plural Carbon Lifecycle um, with uh, MOEJ, actually, we, we are developing the draft guideline of uh, for service technicians on uh, leak inspection and repair for commercial equipment. So um, we have been working with e, e solution and also our local partner, University Technology Malaysia, to draft the guidelines. Um, and we have done the verification workshop in December 2023 with the industry, the uh, associations, and uh, the master trainers for CSTP in Malaysia. So we hope to be conti to continue this uh, project uh, in 2024, and hopefully we can adopt the guidelines in the future. Um, I would sorry. I would like to share um, the recent uh, initiative in Malaysia, uh, which is to promote refugee recovery reclamation um, scheme, which is a cooperation between uh, the government, Daikin and Iwatani, to establish a re refugee recovery reclamation ecosystem uh, in Malaysia. This could be a national model to demonstrate the proper uh, refugee management during servicing, maintenance, and replacement of all all aircon in the market. So we are uh, leveraging on the um, to send it to the uh, recovery and reclamation center. And after that, the all aircon for further uh, um, process. So um, the target is to promote and provide technical trainings to installer and dealers. Uh, currently, this is only for uh, and to promote and contribute. Uh, so the target is to promote uh, and contribute towards uh, carbon emission reduction by 11.5 tons CO2. Uh, this is actually very recent. The launching was done in uh, on the 9th of 2024. Um, but actually, the 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 effort uh, for the promotion have started very earlier, which is I think in June. And the training for the technicians for Daikin have been. Uh, So just to show you some pictures on the uh, launch and also uh, DOE, Mr. Ryan, I, I think you know 
He's very, he's very well known in the NOU in Malaysia. Um, and uh, just to also inform that uh, so um, what, are the, what are the issues and challenges um, in recovery and reclamation in Malaysia? So there is low demand because um, there is abundance of um, supply of virgin gases, uh, HFC and HCFC. Price of reclaimed gas is not competitive because of the process of reclamation. The price could go up and um, could be more expensive than the virgin gas. Um, low number of reclaimed facility in Malaysia. So we have, um, I think, about six mini reclaim um, center and we have about two, which is uh, bigger, bigger in size. Um, and we don't have, uh, currently in Malaysia, we don't have any technical guidelines for the recovery and reclamation. Um, and also on the destruction, the high cost of destruction technology, that is why um, the government is looking into uh, like co-processing um, um, procedure for the destruction technology. And, and also we need more capacity building in terms of the consumer awareness on the importance of uh, certified technicians, um, promotion to recycle and reclaim use refrigerant gas, and um, Capacity building for low GWP and energy efficient technology. Yeah. Okay, what are the way forward uh, for us in strengthening the effort of recovery and reclamation, uh, recovery and recycling? Um, so improve recycling and reclaim reclaim center capacities. Um, we hope to have uh, to develop develop the technical assistance to improve SOP and safety guidelines for the RNR uh, center. Improvement of business model. We are looking into different models, which is, um, um, and we are trying to determine which business model is the most suitable for the situation in Malaysia. Training to improve uh, efficiency of reclamation. To uh, also to improve uh, in order to. Um, reclaim more gases. And then uh, in terms of policy, we are going to do a feasibility study on current regulation and practices, identify the barriers and challenges, uh, and to recommend uh, ways and ideas, new ideas to strengthen the management of refrigerant in Malaysia. Yeah, uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amy. Always um, very uh, solid uh, presentation. Um, I'm so grateful for your uh, inputs. Thank you very much. Um, now, I would like to invite uh, uh, um, my my friend from Palau, uh, Ms. Uh, Alzina uh, Fleetwood. Uh, she's an uh, uh, ozone depleting substance coordinator of Palau. Um, so can I have you on the screen? Uh, on the podium. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My, my name is Alzina Fleetwood, and I'm the Ozone Depleting Substances Coordinator for the Palau Environmental Quality Protection Board. So the content of my presentation will include the overall current uh, situation regarding the implementation of the Montreal Protocol and Party Agreement, the challenges of refrigerant life cycle in island countries like Palau, and the needs for support regarding the life cycle management and in initiatives Palau has interest in. So Montreal Protocol and Party Agreement. The implementation of the Montreal Protocol and Party Agreement in Palau is ongoing as we continue to ratify new amendments to the Montreal Protocol. Palau is up to date in the Montreal Protocol and its subsequent, subsequent amendments, whether through accession or ratification. Um, for HFCs, we're on track to phase out by 2029. 
uh, we, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but we only, for HFCs, we strictly only uh, imported our 22. So that's the only HFCs that we import. That's why we're able to, um, uh, what's my call it? We're able to phase it out faster than most country, most other countries. And for HFCs, uh, we've already endorsed the uh, Kigali implementation plan. We're in the process of creating our national plan and regional plans so that they can all go together. Uh, some, some challenges of refrigerant life cycle management in Palau. Uh, so uh, refrigerant awareness, uh, we need to start conducting a steady stream of educational awareness through outreach for our communities and utilizing social media to raise awareness. Um, we're starting to do that. We have some challenges in terms of budget and funding to go to other islands outside of the main island. Uh, those travel costs and including all the uh, educational awareness, we're trying to make that into something that we do regularly so that people can look forward and stay updated on the new things um, that we uh, have. Uh, proper handling, so we, have, we need uh, training opportunities for proper handling uh, for industry stakeholders and technicians. Uh, we uh, ship, uh, We that's our main, way of importing is through shipping. We're not quite clear. We don't really uh, do proper handling um, training right now. It's more like, well, they have they get certified, then they, they're able to import once they're certified and have the permit to import. Uh, it's not uh, a training that we have regularly. They get a class and then they get certified for that. Uh, for transport and storage, we need training on trans, uh, safe transport practices and identifying conducive or appropriate storage area for the controlled substances. Uh, controlled substances, we need, it needs to be in a certain temperature to maintain its efficacy. And right now, and that's not something that is feasible for our island. We use what we have, and that's not always something that's conducive to um, the substances that we do import. And for recovery and recycling, uh, practicing recovery and recycling instead of just topping up for maintenance purposes is something that we need as well. We do not have a recycling machine on island right now. So like I said, um, those are some of the challenges that we are uh, encountering and trying to find solutions for at the moment. And then for end of life disposal is having a disposal scheme in place. Um, right now, we don't have an incinerator or waste to dispose any refrigerants on island. We store them right now while we look for other, uh, while we, within the Pacific region and other countries that we partner up with for those, um, for more feasible um, disposal. Needs for support in life cycle management. I basically covered that as well in the last one, but for policies and regulations, uh, we need to update uh, our policies and regulations to reflect current agreements and amendments that we ratify. I don't know if for the bigger countries here, if that's a problem for you, that's a problem for a lot of us island countries. We tend to uh, ratify uh, amendments and agreements, but the process of creating policies and regulations to um, monitor and actually implement those agreements and amendments is not always up to date or put in place in time. So sometimes we start practicing um, the reduction of certain things with no proper policies that we're working under. So that's one of also our main goals is getting those into place, but that's also something that it, it goes into the government and the Congress or parliament, and that's why it takes so long. And then for disposal scheme, like I mentioned, um, we don't have a way to dispose any contaminated or expired refrigerants, so we store them for now. And we store them in a shed. That's a shed for my our office for Environmental Quality Protection Board, where we look for uh, a way to dispose them. And then equipment, like mentioned as well before, is we uh, really need uh, equipment to stay on top of everything that we do ratify, uh, like uh, recovery, uh, refrigerant cleaning machines, and refrigerant and uh, refrigerant refrigerant identifier. 
that identifies the different gases that are uh, important in island. Uh, lastly is training, training for the technicians on new equipments that we do get. And when I say training, it doesn't just mean equipments for them to train on. I mean somebody that also knows how to train people in the different specific fields. It's also hard to get somebody on island for those. So we really need help with that. And training for the National Ozone Unit as well, for the management, how to run the overall unit for everybody's benefit. So that's my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for, for your presentation, um, um, Alzina. Uh, good to know that the well, very unique uh, uh, position and situation uh, where uh, uh, island countries have. And I think um, well, there are uh, uh, big attention um, to island uh, situation, how we're going to address um, life cycle refrigerant management together uh, with the international community. Thank you very much for your input. Now, um, uh, I would like to invite uh, our special guests. Um, actually, well, he's not from um, Asia and Pacific, but uh, 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 Moises um, uh, Alvarez, uh, he came um, all the way from um, Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. And uh, we actually requested for um, him to participate in this uh, group seminar because um, um, we, we actually had the earlier conversation in Nairobi uh, last um, February, I think, um, uh, at the uh, occasion of the uh, CCSC annual meeting. And then he made a really good input for in our discussion on uh, Cooling Hub. And uh, uh, with, with, with uh, his uh, great offer, well, he, he kindly uh, traveled to, uh, to, to Bangkok now. So I would like to uh, invite uh, my friend uh, Moises um, uh, from Dominican Republic to introduce for his uh, 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 own country situation, but also he has an experience of uh, the CDM executive board of the Kyoto Protocol. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I really appreciate the invitation, the time invitation of all the organizers to this uh, seminar, and in particular to Kato-san in Japanese. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Let's let's start immediately. Okay. We okay. Here you can see the in the overall current situation regarding implementation of the Montreal Protocol and the Paris Agreement. Common refrigerant like hydrofluorocarbon as you know, are potent greenhouse gases. All the refrigerant originally before this was the CFC as the hydrochlorofluorocarbon. For example, Freon 22. I don't know, this is not Freon 22, not anymore, probably. But in all installation is Freon 22. The refrigerant leak during production, use and disposal with Deliberate venting occurring in some case, particularly in Article 5 country, developing country. In my country, you know, Caribbean. So the people don't care too much about this. We need to train very well the technician. We are doing this from a long time ago, when they started all these things with the Montreal Protocol. In the United States, like I say, to, to put some figures here, the cumulative effect of the free air emission equivalent to 3.6 billion metric ton of CO2 equivalent. Globally, 24 billion metric ton. With an intervention, refrigerant could contribute to 20% of global climate emission by 2050. As you know, the Montreal Protocol in 1987 has phased out the production and consumption of CSC hydrochlorofluorocarbon. The Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol in 2016 aimed to reduce hydrofluorocarbon emission, potentially avoiding to an, an increase of half degree centigrade it related to 2100, 30 years later in red. Let me tell you something. 
Dominican Republic, we were the first country, one of the first country, that we immediately see the problem. What, what was the problem? The Montreal Protocol, that the problem was we don't see the whole picture. Here is the Montreal Protocol, the Kyoto Protocol, or climate change. I remember very well, 30 years ago. Okay, the, the, we, did, we, did, we had the problem with the ozone layer, and there are some alternatives. One of these alternatives were the, chloro, the hydrofluorocarbon. This is something strange, because hydrochloro, you know, the CFC is chlo, uh, chlorine, fluor, and carbon. introduce hydrogen. This is the eight TFC, the three on 22 that I told before. It relatively good for the ozone layer, but very powerful greenhouse gas. They take the chlorine completely of the CFC. Now it's the hydrofluorocarbon, no problem with the ozone layer, but a very powerful greenhouse gas. that is not, not destroy the, the, the ozone layer and do not contribute to... The alternative is a long time known. Is natural gas refrigerant. Hydrocarbon could be pure, like propane, that is a good food. Hydrofluorocarbon 22. Or blend, some blend that to substitute the uh, CFC 12. Body. And recently, the high pressure uh, CO2. Okay, that's the alternative. Me, we start to this and continue. But we need to. But million hydrofluorocarbon units remain unaddressed, particularly in Article 5 country. Okay, let's continue. I show you a In the west part is 80, and in this part in the east, we speak Spanish. Here is the Dominican Republic in the east part. Something important for the people that want to vacation in a very good place. This is a, <laughs> a commercial. It's very good for making meetings like this, or a meeting we do, because the, this is the first, it's private, but it's the first airport in the Dominican Republic for the quantity of people that receive from everyone, every part of the world. For example, there are flights directly from Moscow to Punta Cana. Now, of course, we have problems with this, but we are not, not, not going to discuss this. Okay. Okay, here, last year, 2023, we made the Kigali Implementation Plan, we finished it. I was, by the way, the consultant of this Kigali Implementation Plan. And here is one part, the activity 4.4, Roman 4. The more important of this, okay, the normal, we need recovery, you know this, it's the same thing with every country. But the important in this case is we talk about storage, we, we will have for the monthly center and so on, but no destruction is included. I don't like this, particularly. I need that we need to go as fast as possible to a destruction for many reasons. The first is that actually we pass a turning point in climate change. Every year, every month, we have 
higher temperature and breaking records of temperature, we cannot wait more. We spent 30 years for doing this. We cannot wait more. You cannot say to a technician or to an industry, put a bank here of hydrofluorocarbon. No, because they need money. Okay, I, I have this bank. Where is the money? We need to put money. For example, I, I worked in Malaysia and they say for the toy, we need money because it's expensive. We cannot take this money for carbon credit. That's the idea behind all this thing. Okay. Look, this is a standard. Gold well, standard, the carbon, many, including obviously the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change, UNFCCC. There are many times but about the methodology and in particular methodology for littering. Okay. There are many, not in the UNFCCC, that I will explain in a moment this. For example, American Carbon Registry, the destruction of on the plenty but also on the plenty. It's not hydrocarbon. Look at the, the day. 35 reclaiming hydrofluorocarbon and freer, not destruction, it's for recycling, you know, because you can't, but this is, some, in my opinion, we need to be very careful with this because the idea is to use the hydrofluorocarbon the uh, use or may reclamation, but in the middle there are some leaking. You know, it's not so easy. I prefer to take all the hydrofluorocarbon and destroy this, in my opinion. Okay, next, destruction of some depleting substance. Uh, look. Also on the practice of a high global warming potential for oh, no refrigeration. Okay, next. Here is the CDN. This belongs to the UNFCCC, as Kato San said, I'm in the executive board of the CDN, almost 10 years in this business. And if you see, this is from 2022, December 2022. There are two, you revise this booklet. The under composition of fluorocarbon, in this case, hydrofluorocarbon 23, that is uh, something that appeared in the production of prion 22. This is star was okay, but it's only to hydrofluorocarbon 23, not the others. And here, energy efficiency and hydrofluorocarbon, but not destroying. The only destroying is this one for hydrofluorocarbon 23. Okay, next. Uh, the idea, how I, I view the possibility of market mechanism, based in my experience in this CDN. I look this from Carbon Containment Lab. It's the only that I have seen that Talk about the destruction of hydrofluorocarbon. Is there are something you can tell me later? Something new. Recovery. Okay, it's a draft already. It's better than nothing, by the way. Uh, methodology, when I saw this, I immediately in the CDN executive board say, well, we need to prepare the methodology as, as soon as possible. But you know the the bureaucracy, time, and many other things that I will explain. Uh, recovery and destruction of hydrofluorocarbon refrigerant. Okay, this draft is something that we can use and adapt to our interest. To put up a, a, a case of Dominican Republic, in the case of Dominican Republic, hydrofluorocarbon consumption in 2022 is around a little bit less than 4, 4 million tons of CO2 equivalent. If we compare with the entire fermentation, methane entire fermentation, is uh, approximately the same. It, that that means that it's okay. Actually, we are studying in the executive board to try to introduce the methodology, probably based in this. But let me explain how this works in the UNFCCC. Look, first, 
Actually, the seeding, as you know, is uh, declining. We have practically in one or two years closed this. The important of this is that there are many methodologies. The next step will be the article 3.4. That will be something equivalent to the CDN. And it's highly probably to not spend time to use like a draft or, or with few modifications, the methodology that already exists in the CDN. Well, look, the CDN, the CDN is almost closing. Up here, the Article 3.4, that will be the future. But as I told you here, the transition is very low, Paris Agreement. A possibility, in my opinion, the only thing that you can go actually to go to the Article 3.4 is this uh, an app, something like this, that you can make, introduce a project like a private consideration. Okay. You cannot go to the United Nations Framework Convention like I, I make and say, well, we need this methodology. No, no, it's not like this. They have to, they're, they're protocol. The idea is to have a project that includes a methodology, that this methodology includes carbon. We introduce this here like a prior consideration. And when we they start to, to prepare like a project like the CDN, originally the CDN, they say, ah, OK, like there, there is a, a methodology that talk about hydrofluorocarbon, they discuss and make some, some cohesion. And after this, we have the methodology. It's not like Moises, Alvarez, or, or Cato say, I agree, or no, no. We need to prepare a project and so it's there. And I think that there are projects here. That's the idea that, that I suggest. So I suggest in this moment, uh, for finishing, to present a project using the prior consideration. That is the only thing that we have actually. We are preparing everything, but you know, it's relatively slowly. That's the problem. The velocity of the climate change is not like the bureaucracy. The climate change is very fast. We are always behind this. And then a draft, like the draft, and basic in the other draft that I showed you before. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, uh, it's it's very important to, uh, point that well, in uh, tomorrow we are going to um, uh, discuss uh, the carbon markets and and for for uh, realizing uh, uh, emissions uh, reduction for in uh, robust uh, uh, measurement reporting verification and also ensure. Uh, uh, environmental integrity. Well, we need to have uh, uh, good methodologies for um, um, MRV. So uh, I think uh, you um, provided kind of like a preview of um, the current situation of uh, methodologies development. And tomorrow, Shane um, from uh, CC Lab from the US uh, is going to talk uh, to methodology aspects as well. Thank you very much um, for your uh, uh, inputs. Um, so the, before going to the next session, I would like to invite um, questions or comments or if there are any. Um, I think there are uh, lots of interesting uh, points uh, that are made uh, from uh, different uh, country representatives. Um, any uh, uh, points are okay. Um, if you have, uh, well, we have a um, um, microphone on people um, here um, so that the, yeah, if, you, if you have any questions or comments, well, please. Uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand. Okay, Shanae, please. Just, just, just before you, can you yes. introduce yourself? Please? Sure, I'm Sinead Crotty from the Carbon Containment Lab. I actually had a follow-up question for you, Mr. Alvarez, um, specifically around your uh, sort of suggestion that methodology should go through this prior consideration sort of portal. Does it require a project on the ground to apply for that, or should folks like us who have written methodologies try and get in there a priori and sort of get those methodologies passed for prior consideration? 
Yes, correct. You have a draft. Yes. Okay. No problem. You need to have a project. Mm -hmm. Probably you have one. Okay. And to immediately, but now, you can go all time to do this. Fantastic. And later, we, because there are, I will send you, you can give me your email. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I gave you my and uh, my WhatsApp too. I can send you the, the part of the web page that all the the steps that we need to follow to present a methodology. But it's together with the project. It's not alone. We need to be. And if you need some advice, you can contact me. Because Fantastic. Thank you. Year, I hope I I will continue. I don't know the next year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Good point. There are any other um, points you want? Okay, um, Mirza from. Okay, you introduce yourself, Mirza, please. Can you raise your hand, Mirza? Mirza? Oh yes. Hello, uh, I'm Mirza from Maldives. Uh, well, my question is to Amy. Uh, Amy from uh, Malaysia. Um, uh, regarding the Daikin case, so uh, just wondering uh, whether. There is a EPR in Malaysia that tied to that case, uh, extended producer responsibility, because it also involved uh, the taking out all the old uh, uh, ACs and then also the destruction. My, yeah. So do you have any uh, act uh, regarding the EPR? And then was it that helped uh, with the Daikin case? Thank you. Thanks, Mirza. Um, okay, for the EPR, uh, currently we don't have, um, but under the e-waste regulation that we are developing right now, um, I understand that there will be some elements of EPR uh, in that regulation, but I cannot comment uh, in detail on the EPR because um, it will be under the another division, but I understand that there is an element of EPR in that. Okay, um, Adita, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am Adit Pilar from Carbon Containment Lab. Uh, again, my question is to Amy from Malaysia. Uh, Amy, uh, I have a question for you as well. Uh, again, on the EPR bit, uh, how are we uh, channelizing the air conditioners and refriger uh, refrigerators manufactured by Daikin to the uh, e-waste recycling facility? How are these products differentiated by the other OEM uh, products, right? And uh, the next question is on, uh, it is being prioritized that rec recovery and reclamation, uh, not destruction. And how are e-waste rules coming up? Is it going to focus on reclamation rather than destruction or just destruction? Uh, reclamation is just for a daikin or not? How the other OEMs will perceive it? Uh, next question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you for the question. So currently this program uh, only covers uh, air conditioning um, um, by Daikin, but um, for the collection of all aircon, all aircon, uh, all OEM aircon, other brands also will be collected, but it will be collected by the Daikin technicians, Daikin and Exxon technicians. So um, currently this is uh, actually uh, an effort by Daikin which is, uh, we think it is a very good starting point because Daikin is the may, the, the, the biggest producer of aircon in Malaysia. Um, on the destruction, um, sorry, I think you are, you are talking also about um, how it is um, going to be sent to e-waste recycler, right? Um, actually, um, um, all the all aircon from Daikin will be collected um, in one center and then it will, the aircon will be sent to the reclamation center first. So after all the gases is uh, reclaimed uh, or recovered, um, then they will send the product to e-waste recycler. Yeah. Mm. What is again the question about destruction? <laughs> tools which are uh, being developed, I think which are in the development. Uh, is it going to have a reclamation component as well or just the destruction part? Or the reclamation is just for the Daikin uh, group? Okay. Yeah. Um, the reclamation is uh, is going to cover all uh, equipments. 
um, and there will be uh, we are planning to um, develop a guidelines on recovery and reclamation and also this could this will be um, included in the e-waste recycling uh, guidelines but uh, currently the the progress of e-waste is we are still developing the the regulations yeah thank you so much right thank you very much um okay well so uh, it's a very good uh, start of uh, the interaction thank you very much for for your question and also uh, uh responses uh, uh from the speakers so well this concludes the very uh, uh first part of the um substantive session um uh, uh, re uh regarding our country's um updates um on life cycle refrigerant management thank you very much for the speakers um then uh, the next one um, is going to be the, uh, the session to share the progress of lifecycle refrigerant management um, under the ADB project. And as a moderator, um, I would like to invite uh, Mirza from uh, Maldives uh, to um, proceed for this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Well, actually, this is not my actual voice. So um, uh, this is a new one now. So maybe for the uh, next two days, uh, you will have to deal with that. <laughs> Those who are going to um, uh, uh, communicate with me. And uh, well, um, so now we have, uh, we will be continuing with the country presentations. And uh, first, uh, we have the overview of ADB's carbon market program by Mr. Tetusa Yanasi. Yes. Okay, good morning, um, Sadika, everyone. And this is Tatsuya Yanase from ADB. Um, I am in charge of one of ADB's trust fund to diffusion of low carbon technologies, especially for utilizing the uh, one of the uh, carbon market mechanisms, uh, which is uh, JCM joint integrity mechanism. So today, um, before I uh, get into the, uh, the presentation from the participating countries, I just want to um, uh, provide some background of the uh, ADB's activities on the carbon market, carbon market, as well as the, the overview of the, our technical assistance for the uh, life cycle management of four carbons. Okay, so this is a little bit a busy slide, but to start with this, this is the state and trends in international carbon market. And Carbon market can incentivize the diffusion of uh, advanced low carbon technologies and solutions and unlock investment opportunities, including those for private sector. And also it can foster cooperation among ADB member countries and help them in achieving their respective NVC target cost effectively and contributing to raising climate ambition over time. So in addition, uh, it can enhance private sector's engagement with climate action and help meet their net zero target cost effectively. So this is the this is the um, this slide shows the landscape of international carbon markets, uh, which is keep evolving uh, with distributed and fragmented carbon markets are emerging. So in fact, um, as you can see here, that the uh, there are several and varying projections on international carbon market sites. So for example, as a part of the World Bank, resource flows and the full inter uh, international uh, trading can be 185 billion in 2030. On the other hand, pr uh, prognosis for voluntary carbon market is highly uncertain and ranges from 10 billion to 150 billion in 2030. So this is the uh, landscape of international carbon market and this is very complex. Okay, um, so carbon pricing creates uh, 
price on carbon dioxide and or other greenhouse gases emissions. So although the carbon pricing is widely seen as the most cost-effective solution to have an economy-wide impact on emissions, but it is not only instrument policymakers have at their disposal. And in fact, uh, carbon map pricing is not a panacea and it, it has to be implemented in tandem with other policy instruments. So when implemented in tandem with other policies within an adequate policy framework, carbon pricing can bring substantial gains to both economy and the environment. So by, ass by assigning a cost to a carbon dioxide other greenhouse gas emissions, carbon pricing cre creates an economic incentive to reduce these emissions. This mechanism works um, by internalizing the external cost associated with the greenhouse gas emissions, ensuring that um, true environmental impact is reflected in the market. As a result, carbon pricing aims to achieve reduction in GHG emissions in a cost-efficient manner. Uh, encourage the businesses and individuals to adopt cleaner, more sustainable uh, practices. Okay, so there is a landscape of carbon pricing instruments. So within this, the carbon tax and uh, cap and trade and or emission trading systems are very common, um, but baseline and crediting mechanism are also very popular. So carbon tax creates a financial liability for emitters, giving them incentives to innovative and transit to clean energy and energy efficient operations. And cap and trade program typically involves a government set quantitative limit on the level of greenhouse gas emissions allowed with the uh, system, leaving the price for emissions to be determined by the market. So baseline and crediting mechanism include the international carbon markets, such as uh, those under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, as well as the voluntary carbon market. These, um, car uh, these markets are gaining the increased moment, uh, momentum at the moment. Okay, so this is the, um, so this is uh, with that, that, it is therefore that not surprising that uh, we, are, uh, we see a growing momentum on the use of the carbon pricing in the Asia and the Pacific. So seven, pri seven carbon pricing initiatives have been implemented in the national level. And um, for example, Japan and the Singapore employ a carbon tax and Kazakhstan and New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, and the People's Republic of China, and the most recently Indonesia have launched a nationwide ETS. So in Asia and the Pacific, ASEAN countries are increasingly adopting carbon pricing instruments. Vietnam is currently developing its carbon market, whereas Thailand and the Philippines are considering implementing carbon markets. Okay, so let me go into the introduction of our carbon market program. So in the view of such situation now, ADB is implementing its carbon market program more than 10 years. And ADB through its carbon market program has longstanding engagement with carbon finance and carbon market. It provides the access to carbon finance to catalyze investment in low carbon technologies and solutions and enhance climate mitigation actions in our developed member countries through the two pronged approaches. The first, it provides the upstream, midstream, and downstream support for carbon market development and en enhances the DMC's ability to take advantage of emerging carbon market opportunities. And the second, it mobilizes innovation carbon finance from international carbon market through ADB carbon funds. Okay, so this is the list of programs uh, operated under the CMP. Uh, with some some of each descriptions, but I will briefly touch on one by one from next slide. So this is a future uh, carbon fund. Uh, this, the future carbon fund is a trust fund established in uh, established and managed uh, by ADB on behalf of fund participants. So that's the fund. Uh, the fund. Uh, uh, provides the financial and technical support for clean development mechanism project. It, 
it became operational in January 2009, but it, this fund closed last year. So second one is the Japan Fund for the Joint Crediting Mechanism. This is uh, the fund uh, which I, I'm in charge of. And uh, this J, uh, we call this a JFJCM. JFJCM is a single donor trust fund established in 2014. The fund seeks to increase the sustainability of ADB financed and administered projects through the use of the advanced low carbon technologies. The use of JFJCM grant will demonstrate the effectiveness of the JCM and provide a source of additional funding to eligible ADB developed member countries. The fund will also um, offer the opportunity for recipients to engage in project strong development characteristics and long-term climate change mitigation benefits. The JFGSM also aims to contribute to global climate change and the development initiatives such as Paris Agreement and SDGs. Okay, this isn't the trust fund, uh, this capacity development program. And the Article 6 support facility, uh, uh, we called it A6SF, was established in two, uh, 2018 and began operation in 2019 with support from Germany and Sweden. And this provides a technical capacity building and policy development support to the MCs to enhance their capacity and preparedness to participate in and take advantage of international carbon market emerging under the Paris Agreement. The A6SF has, helps DMCs to develop policy frameworks and the requisite institutional infra, infrastructure for participating in carbon markets, as well as gaining experience through the design and the development of pilot mitigation actions. To implement, we are providing in-country support and regional support. So this is the example of the regional support. Uh, we carried a series of workshop and training programs to provide policymakers knowledge on issues related to uh, carbon pricing, more broadly to specific training programs on Article 6, uh, such as on institutional infrastructure and piloting. So some of our major uh, initiative includes this is the uh, regional training program on climate policy, carbon pricing, uh, carbon markets and art Article 6. And the second one is here, a regional uh, dialogue on carbon pricing jointly organized, organized with the UNFCCC and other UN partners mm -hmm. and ADB uh, around the table on Article 6. So this kind of information technology uh, exchange and learning from each other is uh, highly varied with, the, uh, with countries. So in designing capacity building uh, event, Countries benefit from case studies and practical example of what is happening elsewhere. So a dedicated platform to support this will be beneficial. Okay, so this is the last slide for the uh, introduction of the uh, CMP work. So uh, ADB announced that the COP28, it's Climate Action Catalyst Fund, CACF, a first of its kind common fund under the Paris Agreement. The fund aims to mobilize innovative carbon finance through the purchase of carbon credit to catalyze investment in transformative mitigation action in ADB's developed member countries. So the fund will provide upfront finance to high impact climate mitigation actions for the future delivery of carbon credit under the long-term transactions. In significant contrast to the unusual carbon market practice, uh, or payments upon delivery, which can take years to benefit uh, project owners. So by prioritizing high quality climate mitigation actions and environmental integrity, the fund will help to diffuse advanced low carbon technologies and deliver sustainable development impacts for the local communities in Asia and the Pacific. Okay, so uh, let's move into the, the introduction uh, of the uh, overview of our technical assistance for the promoting life cycle management of low carbons. So as I mentioned earlier, um, sorry, uh, this, the technical support has facility has been one of the main instruments uh, through which ADB has provided technical and capacity building support to its uh, our developed member countries for enhancing mitigation actions through carbon markets. So that technical 
capability has been implemented through a series of six technical assistance projects since 2006, uh, with a total funding of 13.2 million US dollars. And uh, this uh, technical support facility currently provides um, participating development by countries with technical and capacity building support for promoting life cycle management of flow carbons and energy efficiency in the cooling industry through technical assistance 6730. So this TEA supports uh, participating DMCs, namely Maldives, Mongolia, and Philippines, and Vietnam, in improving policies related to flow carbon management, identifying appropriate technologies, and, and the identifying investment project for ADB. So this aims to increase the use of climate friendly and low global warming potential refrigerant as an alternative to flow carbons in the cooling sector. So to effectively uh, enhance the technology and uh, technical knowledge and capacity, this TA conducted a comprehensive policy analysis of the participating DMCs with reference to the global good practice. So this includes this will include the assessing of the current status of life cycle management of flow carbons and energy use in the cooling industry. Now, and then additionally, the national and regional seminars and workshops was held to facilitate knowledge exchange. And this is the event is included in this uh, item. And the knowledge pro products will be developed to further support uh, these initiatives. And to advanced uh, technologies and innovative solutions, the TA identified available advanced technologies, business models, and other innovative approaches relevant to the sector involved. So the TA also uh, analyzed the potential applicability uh, and effectiveness, then presented the technology options tailored to the local context of each participant DMCs. So based on this, uh, we will prepare the tailored recommendations on the life cycle management of flow carbons to each country. So the, the recommendation will include the legal, institutional, and the financial aspect. For example, the possible use of the carbon market mechanism under the Paris Agreement, such as JCM. Okay, so this is a final slide from my side. So the TA organized a series of webinars and enhanced our knowledge and awareness on um, the life cycle management of HFCs. A workshop on developing regulatory frameworks and technology options and participating in the global events to advocate life cycle management of HFCs in the international platforms. So today, as I said earlier, that the representatives from the um, each participating countries, uh, they will make a presentation about the current status, status of the life cycle management of flow carbons and what they have done in, uh, under this program and what is the lesson learned, the findings, whatever. So yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I guess, yes. He has lots of experience and also funds. So make use of that, make use of this opportunity. And uh, I know that there are a lot of um, uh, people from the uh, Montreal Protocol and Ozone and uh, the uh, Carbon Market Program might not be very familiar for us, not yet, but it's a good opportunity. So use it. And then, yes, we also have uh, people joining online. So um, please write your questions in the chat box and then... Uh, we can also answer. Use this opportunity. Anyone? Yeah. Or do you want to wait for tomorrow? Yes. So you can have uh, go through today again with the presentation and then maybe wait for tomorrow. Yeah, you should.
Um, th thank you. Uh, my name is Fukuya Ino, UNIDO representative in Thailand, Malaysia, and Myanmar. Um, I would like to ask, so we are preparing now the th uh, Thailand uh, emission trade system to be launched next year. Um, how does this JCM uh, uh, and other regional mechanism will, could should interact with the national uh, emission trade system? And second question is uh, how should we incorporate the refrigeration uh, part in the emission trade system? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh your question so you are kind of engaging in the developing the uh, sorry, supporting the uh, ets system in the thailand at this moment so this is a very difficult, difficult challenging questions how to harmonize this kind of carbon market mechanism within the country so um sorry i, I have a limited uh, program but for sure that we have some experiences because we have come uh, support, several supporting countries in a six sf and in uh, to make a kind of tailor-made some support uh, to provide tailor-made support so we can uh, compare this kind of each context and what can be done in each countries so we can compare that kind of, um that each context and then we can somehow uh, we discuss further on how can how, how we can harmonize these uh, different carbon market mechanisms in, in specific countries. So I don't have any clear answer at this moment. But so and the second question is how to include the um, fluorocarbons in this uh, carbon market mechanism. So this is uh, one of our biggest challenge at this moment, actually. So um, actually, this one of the biggest uh, objective to hold this event is that not only for you know. Um, sharing the uh, kind of experiences, uh, life cycle management of flow carbons, but also the how to make a next step to make a, a kind of, you know, accelerate this uh, kind of activities, utilize the carbon market. So that's why uh, I try to, you know, uh, provide some uh, kind of uh, background of carbon market. And as well as tomorrow, we will have a session to discuss about how to, you know, utilize the carbon market in a, in a hydrofluorocarbon carbon uh, life cycle management. So, yeah, that's a challenge. But as you may know that there are so several, many experts here, so different uh, sectors, like specific on life cycle management, but also the carbon market experts. So that would be the great opportunity to discuss further uh, about this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anderson Alves. I am the regional coordinator for Chemicals and Waste Hub of UNDP here for Asia Pacific. And uh, well, we are discussing this in the framework that we develop in countries. I, I say we because I'm Brazilian, so I also need to comply. <laughs> My country also need to comply with the Kigali Amendment. So we are discussing this under the framework of the Kigali Amendment. And the framework of the Kigali Amendment in the end is to reduce the consumption of HFCs which by itself is like already a contradiction to the uh, carbon credit scheme, right? Because to have a carbon credit, you need to demonstrate the high integrity and how this, uh, let's say, supply of uh, HFCs will go over the time. So you can calculate uh, all the mathematics, all the economics behind uh, the investment and the, and the, and the uh, payback of uh, any of this uh, reclamation and recycling structure. So my question is how we combine this with the proposals that you, we are discussing this, right? At the same time, the countries need to reduce, but then you have a carbon credit that acts more or less like a stabilization. Like you, you need to have a the demand of consumption to, to do it. And then link it to high integrity because the 6.4, article 6.4 require this high integrity. So how we are not uh, putting in place a mechanism that actually foster imports of HFCs that later will be reclaimed and uh, or destructed to uh, to feed the the carbon credit maker. This is the one. The second one is much more about the cohesion that is related to cost. Right? We need to establish a cost uh, benefit, a cost uh, effectiveness 
so we can understand how much money they will invest first to later sell the carbon credit is right is usually is how it works right uh and uh, this is very important because with the Kigali amendment, with the HFCs, you have a big variation in GWP values. So if the country makes a decision to, for example, focus in room air conditioning sector, basically focus in a sector that has a mid to low GWP because HFC 32 has already is already dominating the Asia market. So they have to invest much more money to get the carbon credit back. But if they choose 404, which is almost 4,000 the GWP, then you can have much less effort and then get, uh, let's say, the same level of money. In the same, at the same time, 404 that have, has much less alternatives in the market uh, to comply with the Kigali Amendment. And then comes back the high, uh, high integrity, right? Because they basically you are kind of making the market continue to use 404. So how you conciliate uh, also this cost benefit if you have a number or if you have suggestion when the country, because I ask you this because we are helping these countries to develop the Kigali Amendment strategy. So if they want to put in their Kigali Amendment strategy carbon credit, then they need to justify to the donors of the MLF why they are seeking carbon credit at the same time they are paying the reduction. Yeah. Thank you. They want to So due to the time constraint, uh, I will discuss, discuss further on the coffee type for free break or something like that. So just briefly uh, response to your questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to be honest, this is the uh, our first uh, attempt to you know marginalize this uh, utilize the carbon market in a life cycle management through carbon. So, um, you know, especially regarding the second question, this is a very good question and very important. So make it kind of for from our side to make it kind of bankable project with and um, considering the kind of you know money money flow and full benefit or something to make it a cost effective you know project this is very important and so that's why we are gathering together and discuss further what is the problem and uh, what are possible you know the challenges and hurdles of this uh making happen but um the first question sorry what, what is the first so to sorry Uh, yes. Yeah, this is also many different <laughs> questions. Yeah, we need to. Yeah, but yeah, we need to discuss. Um, you know, the uh, supporting country uh, more detail about the uh the the target uh of the greenhouse gas emission reduction of especially for the hydrocarbons. carbons. And as well as how to how they can utilize the uh, carbon market as a tools to accelerate that kind of activities. So we need to you know seek the uh, potential you know, stabilized you know line for this and um, make it this uh, very useful. Uh, I mean the carbon market as a useful tools to make it happen. But there is no kind of you know one answer to utilize it for every country but anyway we need to discuss the in concerning with the each local context anyway thank you thank you um before we we will then move to country presentation but uh those who have questions and online participants also do write it down so that uh you can ask your uh the doubts you can clear your doubts and uh get answers uh during tomorrow's session uh we have it's a carbon credit mechanism tomorrow. Uh, just one session on that specific session for that. So um, write it down. And then uh, we will move to uh, country presentations, uh, update uh, of the uh, uh, projects under ADB. And uh, first we have Maldives. I'm from Maldives, by the way. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. And I'm Aisha. I'm from the Ministry of Climate Change, Environment and Energy. And myself and Mr. Firag will be presenting on the progress of promoting life cycle management of HFCs in, from the Maldives. So, um, 
So just to begin with, I'll give a brief introduction of the Maldives and a general overview of the HFCUs. So we are a small nation with like uh, just above like 1,000 islands and a population of 400,000 people residing in about 200 inhibited islands. So tourism and fishing are the main industries and there are about 100 islands developed as resorts. And this keeps on increasing. So the size of islands range from about 0 0.2 kilometer squares and 80% of inhabited islands have less than um, one square meter kilometer. So just to speak of population density, 41% um, of the population um, lives in the greater Mali region. So this is made up of Mali, Hulumale and the surrounding islands. So because of, in, uh, we have like, because of the hot and humid environment, air conditioning and refrigeration is a necessity. And due to the increased econ economic growth and increase in housing and commercial developments all over the country, there is more of an increase in um, RSC equipments. So, um, and about 80% of the consumption is in the greater Mali region mainly again in the housing and tourism sector. And as you can see, Mali is about like one of the most condensed, like uh, congested cities all in the world. Um, so I'm just gonna touch on the main uh, sectors using RSC equipment. So since the phasing out, of HCFCs in 2020, we have see, seen a steady increase of HFCs across the country. So some of the main sectors using HFCs are housing and apartments, other dwellings, commercial and tourism, resorts, hotels, safari boats, guest houses, fishing, so which includes fishing boats, coal storages, and ice making plants, and food processing, so canning facilities, transportation vessels, and um, coal storages. And, and transport, so, um, and um, in MAC, and also in like boats. So in um, overall, H, we, do, we are not a uh, country that produces on manufactures. So HFCs are only used in the servicing sector. So during the HFC survey, the supply chain of refrigerants in the Maldives is, no, is not very long. So most of the people who in, uh, import are also end users. So in fisheries, tourism, and food processing, most of the servicing requirements are carried out in-house by technicians and maintenance personnel. And here we can see the HFC consumption in the Maldives. So most of the domestic servicing sector right now uses R410A. In the fishery sector, the most common HFCs are R134A, R404A, and R410A. And we, um, I would also not like to note that uh, the fishery sector also uses um, a fair amount of ammonia, especially in coal storages and collection vessels. So in, and in tourism, the most widely used refrigerants are R134A, R404A, and 410 and 134A. And Similarly, in coal storages, R404A, R407, and R410A as the main refrigerants. And um, I would also, and then for the next part of the presentation, I would like to pass it on to Mr. Firag to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Asha, for the uh, brief introduction on the Maldives and also the providing the status of uh, HFC uh, management in the Maldives. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Abdul Firag. I'm actually working as a local consultant for this um, ADB uh, TA. I will... Uh, Actually, I will provide a brief overview of the what we are being uh, what been doing on the uh, this TA uh, and also the kind of support that uh, ministry and the government is actually expecting uh, to move forward. So 
regarding the uh, this specific TA, uh, actually we have done four main uh, four uh, four main areas. First one is we have conducted the gap analysis. That's a basically policy gap analysis. What are the kind of uh, already existing policies and what are the additional policies that we need for the country to implement the fluorocarbon management? And also then we try to implement the HFC inventory. Uh, that's basically providing a methodology to uh, create the HFC inventory and also a reporting mechanism uh, for the ministry that can be used for the uh, reporting uh, as well. And also then uh, we have uh, tried to identify the potential uh, technology options for different sectors like uh, air conditioners, uh, uh, other ref, uh, ref, uh, areas. And also we have provided the feedback for the uh, 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 to the ministry and also the relevant stakeholders. And also the conducted uh, uh, training sessions and also the workshops for the uh, stakeholders, I think. Uh, and also the finally provide the recommendations based on these four activities uh, 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 is the actually main object of this uh, TA. Uh, yeah, first I will look into the first uh, uh, part of this TA. The main actually, we started with uh, doing the gap analysis, basically the policy gap analysis uh, for the Maldives. What are the uh, existing status and uh, what are the additional policies that's required? Actually, if you look into uh, Maldives, actually, more, more, main of the policies are targeted to the uh, controlling of the ODS. Uh, that is actually very helpful. And uh, our ODS has gone down uh, quite uh, dr uh, drastically. But at the same time, because of this, uh, HFC also increased uh, uh, as well. Uh, actually, Maldives is in the, currently in the process of uh, implementing a uh, new, uh, uh, new act. That's called the Montreal Protocol Enforcement Act. This this actually covers main part uh, main actually things that's required for the HFC, including the import of uh, 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 implementing import export uh, quarters and also the import li importing licenses and also the standardized standardizing as of the regulation on the recovery and uh, recycling as well. And in addition to this, we have identified other uh, potential uh, initiatives that can be included in the policy level and also I mean the index and also in the other policies as well. Some of them are uh, including the tax and refund mechanism, uh, basically included in the tax when you import the HFC and the refund mechanism when you destroy or recycle uh, re recycle those. And also introduce subsidies for the low, carb, uh, low GWP HFCs and, uh, and also having the uh, registration for the licensing part, uh, li uh, uh, service providers and, and those things. And in addition to this, we have also recommended a few, uh, few other initiatives including currently the national NDC doesn't include the include of HFC. So we recommend to include this HFC in the national uh, uh, NDC as well. So that will promote reduction of uh, uh, NDC, uh, sorry, uh, HFC. Mm -hmm. And also include the uh, integrate HFC in other policy uh, documents for, such as a uh, strategic action plan uh, and also more this energy policy and also any energy efficiency uh, act as well. Currently, these uh, policy documents doesn't cover uh, HFC. I think that will help mostly energy-related sectors that will help to reduce HFC or manage the H uh, HFC in the country. And also introducing the financial mechanisms like uh, uh, grant loans so for, the, for the people so that they can introduce low GWP uh, HFCs in the country. The second one, sorry. The second one we focus was actually on in, uh, making uh, HFC inventory. Actually, the aim is actually to provide a methodology to create HFC in, uh, uh, inventory in the Maldives. And also it's, uh, it is a, something that can be used, as, used for the reporting mechanism as well. Uh, the main information actually that we are using for this is from the uh, 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 custom statistics. Uh, Maldives doesn't actually create any uh, HFC within the country or uh, only import and also as a bulk and also with uh, uh, as a pre-charge in, within the equipments and also we don't export any. So uh, we have a lot of detail on the custom statistics what we import in, especially the bulk imports and also the number of uh, kind of uh, uh, equipments that we are importing. But things currently we, we are missing is the detail of these specific equipments what are the types types of equipment uh, kind of capacity actually hfc is precharged with these 
those informations are currently missing for the uh, in the import data. So what we have what we have what we have done is we had a lot of assumptions actually to calculate this, but uh, we have uh, produced a methodology estimating this. What are the kind of I mean the consumption in the country? Uh, actually, the graph actually shows the uh, first one is kind of bulk import. As you can see, once the control is impl implemented in the OD, uh, this uh, OD, uh, ODS, this uh, ODF use is actually going down within the country. And also at the same time, the HFC is actually moving up uh, drastically. And this one is basically the output from the inventory that we have created. We have included the, all the equipments, basically pre-charge and also how uh, bulk imports are being consumed within the uh, uh, equipments. So as you can see, the HFC is actually growing drastically. And uh, so that means we have, implement, uh, we have to implement the HFC uh, controlling mechanism to control this. The other tech, uh, activity that we conduct is actually providing a guidance for the technical options available for the Maldives. Actually, uh, like other countries, we have few options. Uh, mainly, we are using imported uh, equipments. Uh, the main options we have, uh, alternative refrigerants we have, is basically the natural refrigerants like uh, uh, ammonia or uh, hydrocarbons and also the HFOs. But the thing is, we can't really use these alternatives in all the equipments. Basically, those technical options are not available. So that means we are prom uh, we are promoting use of low GWP uh, HFCs to use within the uh, with uh, within this uh, uh, equipment as well. So we have uh, provided in each what are the kind of options we can use for the country, and also uh, what are the other alternatives available considering the like uh, uh, health health plus the safety uh, consideration as well. The other one is actually, uh, we conducted a training workshop for the stakeholders, actually combining this gap analysis and also the inventory and also uh, including the techn uh, technical options available for, the, uh, for these uh, sectors. We presented this to the uh, stakeholders. The main objective is actually create the awareness uh, within the country and also in the rec sector. Uh, what are the kind of options available to manage the uh, HFC, uh, HFC increase? And also, the, what are the potential options uh, as well? During the uh, during the uh, workshop, we also presented, uh, uh, demonstrated actually the uh, leakage detection and also uh, how this can be reduced. And also, we have uh, de uh, demonstrated the uh, the methods how to uh, recover and reclaim the HFCs and also the other uh, uh, refrigerants uh, in most commonly used sector like the refrigeration. Finally, uh, actually, basically, based on these uh, four key activities, we are we are in the process of providing the recommendations uh, for the uh, recommendation paper. The these will cover those uh, uh, things that we just I did just discussed. Basically, providing the policy recommendations uh, for the uh, for the country, and also the providing the HFC inventory that covers the methodology, how to produce the inventory, and also the uh, basically reporting mechanism, and uh, alternative uh, options for the uh, refrigerants uh, or the technical options that are available for the sectors, and also the finally uh, currently the MODIS doesn't have any uh, destruction facility, but. Uh, uh, country is actually in the process of uh, implementing waste energy uh, projects. Currently, Modis has three projects, and the central one is under the under the implement. So we are uh, uh, proposing an option, including this uh, with this project, including the waste uh, sorry uh, HFC destruction option as well. Currently, we are working with the specific teams to see the uh, feasibility of uh, this one. Uh, these are actually main uh, activities currently in progress from the project. And finally, uh, we are in the discussion as well, what are the kind of support the uh, ADB and also the TA team can provide uh, to the government. I think main support is actually on t in terms of uh, trainings, uh, such as uh, recovery and uh, reclamation, and also how, how, and also the trainings for the uh, operation maintenance of uh, rec sector service providers as well. This can be, this can include the trainings that can be uh, tailored for the uh, 
uh, in base country uh, in in the country and also the specific trainings that can provide for the uh, specific uh, technicians basically providing the site visits to the uh, some uh, developed countries to show that uh, the status and also how the reclamation uh, and also the maintenance can be done in in the uh, other countries as well so i will just stop here yeah thank you Aisha and uh, Firak, and uh, we will take we will go to all the presentations first, and then uh, maybe question and an answer uh, session uh, for all the countries together. And now we have Mongolia, and uh, I would urge everyone to keep your presentation ten minutes. Good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, my sincere expression to inviting me to this important seminar for organizing uh, organizing organizers um, uh, on behalf of the my colleagues and also the National Consultant of the promoting life cycle um, life cycle management of the fluorocarbon for, uh, technical assistance. The, the our national consultant is uh, unable to present the result of the study at the seminar today because he has become of the, the member of parliament. In this case, I'm going to present this uh, result of the uh, study at the seminar. In this regard, briefing on the country status, Mongolia has a cold climate and uh, with an annual temperature of the minus uh, 0.4 Celsius, and during the summer, average high temperature of the um, plus uh, 40, uh, 24 and 5 centigrade heating is more than important. The cooling in some time in the winter times, sometimes the daily temperature dro drops to uh, minus 40 Celsius, and also in summer, heat up to um, 40 Celsius. Uh, in this uh, study, the mission, uh, uh, the HFC mission in 2020 are uh, estimated at 5,071.30 uh, gigaton CO2 equivalent, which accounts for the uh, 4, 4.4 percent percentage of the national net emission Nine, 1990 uh, and uh, 75 of the emission are attributed to category of two uh, f one of the which uh, 70 uh, nine, nine one of the from mobile air conditioning mostly for used vehicles Regarding to the uh, current uh, policies and project in the country, solid and uh, firm policies on importing and controlling on the ODS and the HCFCs, HFC put in place and several projects has been implemented in the support of the UNEP and government of Japan. As per the um, Kagali amendment was ratified in Mongolia um, in 2020, and it, uh, this is the registered in the UN system. Support for shifting the revision to low, lower GVP alternatives has been provided under the context of uh, the Kagali amendment. While there were not many opportunities for destruction of the uh, revisions, 
The recommendation for Mongolia food emphasis on the possible destruction projects. Uh, as for the ND, NDC target, Mongolia is not included many mitigation measures in HFC emission uh, reduction, nor cooling in the latest uh, NDC to UNCCF. Uh, and um, 2019, even through HFC are uh, covered in its accounting scope. Relating to the, uh, to the HCFC, since 1990, Mongolia has had professional licensing and caught a system for import export of ozone depleting substances, including HFC and H HCFC and HFCs. Mongolia's HPMP is conducted to a stage in a, with UNEP as the leading implementation agency in the government of Japan as the cooperating agency in the both stages. Under the HPMP stage one, and supported by UNEP, Mongolia aimed to aim to uh, to meet a thirty five percent reduction of the HCFC consumption by 20, 2020 from its baseline. The HCFC consumption in two thousand nineteen is uh, rec recorded as uh, uh, one point uh, seventy four ODP tons. It it is uh, it is forty seven reduction from the baseline. The objective of the uh, HPMP stage one was to uh, phase out one ODP tons of HCFC 22 from the baseline, um, 1.4 ODP ton by 2021, which was successfully reached through the combination of intervention in policies and the regulation capacity building of the customs and Citizen technicians and awareness raising under the HPMP stage two, supported by UNEP, Mongolia aims to uh, um, 70, uh, 97, 97.5 percent uh, per reduction of the HCFC consumption by 2030 from the baseline. 18, it is uh, 93rd XCOM. The additional activity for energy efficiency for Mongolia was approved. In regarding to the HFC uh, places, the country is committed to freeze consumption of the HFC, HFC at the baseline level of starting from 2024, the 10% uh, reduction by 2029 and phase on HFC consumption to 80% by 2020, uh, 2035. The preparation of the stage of stage one of the Kigali HFC implementation plan in Mongolia is uh, undergoing. Sway of manufacturer of for this uh, pump sector is conducting by UNIDO. As the current policy and project in the country, the basic laws and the regulation for reducing consumption of HFC, HFC and ODS in, in Mongolia are in the line with the Kigali Amendment. Legal basis for ODS control is Mongolian law on air 2012. The quota leakage system on the import licensing import the registry of the ODS HFC import export are also so on or in place on the government resolution to 277 in 2018. Technical standards are enable application of alternative refrigerants with the higher risk uh, uh, have been already translated and approved domestically, for example, MNSI so 50, 51, 49 um, regarding the refrigeration system and heat pump safety and environmental requirements. Also, the MNS ISO the 8.17. Also, the gas supply system rules for press jewels directive of the 
Ministry of Energy. Also, the MNS technical standards are based on the analogous of ISO standards, so they provide sufficiently compre comprehensive guidelines for working with refrigerants. As, good, as a, a good practice of Mongolia can be found in the form of discount of income tax for importing cooling appliances using for global warming potential alternatives, namely R, R29 and 30, 32. Uh, this is the intention to provide an economic incentive for selection of such equipment, expanding the list for the other alternative reverence may contribute to promoting global warming potential refrigerants further. A revising of this list has been planned under the stage two of the HPNP. The uh, identified issues and constraint, uh, constraints of the DC report has been um, following. The Mongolia has established legal framework for monitoring use of ODS and their substitutes. However, there is a need to do off institutional arrangement for collection, recovery, and distribution, destruction of the used the refrigerants. ODS and HFC are classified in hazardous waste, then dispersed. They low on toxic and hazardous chemicals requires treatment of such substance at the polluters' own expense. A specific regulation for disposal of the, those subst substances. There, uh, this may be attributed to the of life, uh, life cycle management, coordination with other factors such as the energy efficiency program and the waste management will enhance overall eff effectiveness of the policies. NDC does not contain mitigation option of HFC. Inclusion of the HFC mitigation options in the NDC can be considered in the next NDC cycle to justify administration's action. NDC report at uh, how the uh, ABD technical assistance utilized is identified. Major expectation to the technical assistance is the studies with that Mongolia, most critical part of the life cycle management of chlorocarbons is collecting, recovery, and destruction of chances. Also, as per the percursive activity in the area, technical assistance and achievements Focus was paid on the special way destruction of used substances. During the implementation of promote uh, life cycle management of chlorocarbon technical assistance project, capacity building training was organized. The training of the life, uh, life cycle management of fluorocarbon in Mongolia was organized uh, in 2023 in Ulaanbaatar at the, the cooperation of the, the in cooperation with the Institute of Technology. One day, every training consisted of both online and person participants. The training covered presentation of the regulation of the hydrochloro carbon in Mongolia and theoretical guidelines and practical demonstration for recovery of the fluorocarbons. ABD invited speakers from public and private sector of uh, Japan uh, and Mr. Siro Kasai and Mr. Yuki Sakamoto lead on the theoretical and practical session in the fluorocarbon leakage prevention and Production uh, at risk concentration was one of the focus on this study. There are several companies in Mongolia with special license to extract the hazardous chemical waste. After communication of these companies, it was found that three of them have incineration facilities. However, none of them destruct refrigerants. 
for the operation, the Apollo Mangalnar quality requirement MN is 45, 85, and 2016. That are not familiar with the air quality requirement under the Manual Protocol. The, there is some, uh, the three companies, we, we can see the uh, table. As for destruction, it is cement clean, also one of the focus area. There are uh, six uh, cement companies in Mongolia. They are most only located along this railway and paved road in re central region of the country, where the consumption of the air efficient are focused. In that sense, delivery of the air efficient would not cause difficulties. Key challenges would be how to collect them. The economically, it might not be attractive for cement manufacturers since the additional profit from the waste production would be insufficient compared to their major business. However, some companies may be interested to develop the destruction facility because of improved reputation as socially and environmentally responsible organization. There, um, there is uh, of this study on the uh, future activities dwarfed for the for destruction of refrigerant cement clean is worth investigation further on the feasibility. The feasibility study should cover the selection of the localizing of the destruction facility, business model for collection, transportation and operation, and project economic evaluation. In the collection of refrigerant from the waste cars is crucially important for cost effectiveness. Assuming that the car dismantling factory gave a capacity of the 20 cars a day containing below 0.5 kilogram of the R134 A per vehicle would be capable of collecting the three tons of refrigerant about on site recycling of refrigerant may be considered considered in the for KT so uh, CO2 equivalent. In addition, if they recycle, the refrigerant will be redistributed in uh, commercial basis. Uh, certain technical support support on establishing technical standard and so on will be necessary. The expectation of the future activists on this report was feasibility study for destruction of irrefrigerant at cement clean support of the ABD grant. Construction of the destruction facility at the cement plant might be conducted by the cement plant owner with support business loan from ABD and paid back by the cement factory on a commercial basis. Thank you for your attention. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm. Wow. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I hope this doesn't pull off again. <laughs> okay, so I'm Roland Dharma Sitamani from the Chemical Management Section of the Environmental Management Bureau. Uh, I think online is Miss Ella Diokadis. Dio uh, she's the uh, consultant of ADB with regarding uh, regards to this TA. So I'll present the uh, updates for this TA. So, a uh, brief uh, history of the uh, Montreal project, uh, Montreal protocol. So, for the CFCs and HCFCs, we have ratified it in 1993, and then the, the ban on importation of CFCs uh, was um, ordered on 1998. So, we have the 2001 Copenhagen amendments for the HCFCs, and we started the phase down on 2013. So by 2020, we have reduced the HCFC imports by 35%. And by 
And by 2025, we hope to have uh, reduced it by 67.5%, and by 2030, by 97.5%. And then finally, by 2040, we have uh, HCFC imports banned. So it, I think it's similar to uh, a lot of countries here. So for the HCFCs, uh, HFCs, uh, we have ratified it in 2022, but uh, before that, we have already uh, accomplished uh, the uh, DNR Administrative Order 2021-31 regarding the HFC. So uh, we started the baseline, uh, the counting of the baseline for our HFCs um, from 2022 2022. So starting this year, we have... Uh, uh, we started to freeze the um, the amount of importations for HFCs, and by 2029 we are to reduce uh, by 10%, and by 2035 we aim to reduce by 35%, and by 2040 we aim to reduce by 50%, and by 2045 we aim by 80%. So. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with this. Uh, most of us here are not um, producers of HFCs, so most of our imports are also equ equivalent to our consumption for the HFCs. So uh, it's an easy computation. So for 2018 to 2022, we have here the uh, importations of all of our uh, HFCs. So here you can see that the, the brown graph, the brown bar, and the uh, gray bar, I think it's one of the, uh, it's two of the most important HFCs. I think this is the 134A and the 410A. So the top five is 134A, 410A, R404A, uh, R236FA, and R26. So we have here the baseline that we're going to use for the um, the rest of the computation until 2040. So we have, um, as you can see, we the uh, HFC consumption during 2022 has increased by a lot. I think I think they anticipated that the average will, you know, uh, increase because of the 2022. So, okay, so the current status of our HFC management for the Philippines, uh, we have an online registration for all importers of ODS and HFCs. Um, uh, I think this is separate from the registration for the dealers, retailer, retailers, and resellers, but it's in the same system. So we can um, double check the, the, the registrations. So for the distribution of ODS and HFCs from the ports to the end users is through the dealers, retailers, and resellers. So there, we have also a registration for service providers of ODS or HFC using equipment. Uh, I think this is one of the issues that we currently have because uh, uh, we're trying for every region to have a dissemination for the information regarding the registration of these uh, HFCs. Uh, HFC equipment, but I think we have less than 20% of all the um, service providers currently registered in our system. So most of our data will come from the the first uh, but uh, first item, the importers, because uh, they cannot import without our permit. So yes. So we also have the participation of um, refrigeration and air conditioning uh, service centers in refrigerant recovery, recycling, and reclamation initiatives by the Philippine government. And I think I saw online earlier um, our colleagues from TESDA. They're part of the Philippine government um, training the, the service centers. And we also are uh, with the uh, Department of Trade and Industry. And then we also have issues on the treatment and destruction of waste ODS and HFC because we uh, currently have only one um, registered uh, well, this 
one registered uh, retail retailer, I think. No. Um, wait. We have only one destruction facility in the Philippines right now. Uh, I think it's in a project with HPMP. Yes. Okay. So for uh, at this presentation, I only included the left part because it's the um, life cycle management, the TA for ADB. So we have here the objective is for the strengthening of policy and measures, but we also have coordination with, I think um, Makoto San presented earlier, the uh, initiatives for fluorocarbon, fluorocarbons life cycle management. And I think it's included here the destruction facility of the Philippines. So for this presentation, I will uh, focus on the fluorocarbons TA. So it's in collaboration with them, OEJs, IFL, and Japan ICM. It's for supporting the policy development to address challenges on fluorocarbons and identify innovative business models for life cycle management of fluorocarbons. So for this TA, uh, we started in 2022. Um, the main output for now is the policy gap analysis. Yeah. So the output should be strengthened policy and measures and preparation for investment. So for the policy gap analysis, according to our colleagues in uh, ADB, the main recommendations they had for our policies are, uh, first is for a policy on the use of low GWP substances in the refri refrigeration and air conditioning sector. So number two, policy and technical guidelines on the management of HFC waste streams because current policy, policy, policy focuses on ozone depleting substances only. And we, we want to have a policy on the life cycle management of HFCs that will include refrigerant reclamation in addition to refrigerant recovery and recycling. Uh, I think this is especially because um, Philippines is a very archipelagic country. So um, the transport of waste from one uh, one region to another is uh, very a nightmare to, uh, no, to manage. So for the policy on the provision of incentives for waste refrigerant recovery and collection in the life cycle management of HFCs. Okay, so going forward and possible future support needs for this TA, so, of course, the policy gap analysis should be sent to the EMB and the final actions will be based on the recommendations. By So, this way forward is only for this TA. <laughs> Sorry. And continuing cooperation and collaboration. Okay, thank you. And now we have Vietnam. And uh, please note that the faster that we finish, more time we will get for lunch break. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm the last uh, presenter to uh, this morning. And uh, I'm Ba Chien from Hanoi University of Science and Technology. and. I believe that this uh, content should be better represented by uh, National Ozone Coordinator in Vietnam. But uh, uh, as the one who coll collaborate, uh, strong collaborate with uh, uh, DCC from the first day of 8 p.m. to 2, uh, our presentation will bring new perspective to participant here today. Okay, and here is our live our presentation. We will uh, talk briefly about the description of TA 6730 and uh, some uh, introduction about the national policy and laws in Vietnam and some output and impact of the TA. And the one, the last one is summarized. Uh, so here's a chart for uh, the general description of TA6730. Uh, and uh, from the MOU with DCC and ADB, we uh, deliver three, uh, let's say three stages or three pillars in the, the TA. The first one is that we would like to increase the knowledge in action 
uh, assessment in the current policy and laws and regulation. Also, we uh, enhance our capacity building activities is our first stage. And a second test, we would like to conduct the study in the te technology application and innovative solution for business model. And the last one is the support on deploying. Deploying is a very important step, step in our country because uh, we know that on the gap and it is on the capacity building, but if we cannot deploy in, in process, this could be uh, uh, not very high efficiency as I mentioned. So three, necessarily three pillar or three stage has a strong connection with each other and any stuck on any the bottleneck in every step of this uh, three uh, stage could, uh, would not benefit us in deploying uh, to uh, the NFC management. Okay, the national policy and laws, I have to, let's say in the point of view of the uh, science, we have the three layer, the core layer is a law of environment protection and Article 92 in ozone player protection. The second layer is a degree 06, 2022, NDCP on the government date on January 7th, January on 2022. On greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction and uh, ozone layer protection. And another degree on 45, uh, 2022, NDCP, the government delay uh, date on July uh, 7th, July 2022 on sensation at MEG uh, violation in environment protection is a second layer on the our law. And the third layer is that is a circulation, uh, especially the 01 and uh, circulation 22 in um, uh, 2023, uh, uh, TTR, BT, M, and T, something. And that is three layer, we need a construction. So very brief overview about our law. Uh, in Vietnam to to uh, enhance the LFC management. Uh, so let me go to the detail. First one is that the registration and reporting requirement. So we have to read a bit on the Article 24 of degree 0 0.6. And so the step like we have the registration the, on the topics on the website. And then we have just uh, increase the control of the uh, uh, quota based on the um, uh, some criteria as uh, listed on the degree and then we send a new report and on the sector as we see on the, the screen we are we uh, manage and so there are five uh, sector we we control and here is a national single window so we have the single window procedure to improve the process and make it a let to say effortless a way to, to register. And uh, for the, uh, the second step is that the collection, reuse, and recycling and destruction of control substance is very important. And it's released in the Article 28, Degree 06, 20, uh, 22, NDCP. And in here, we are organizing our equipment containing control substance for uh, kind of we make the criteria for, uh, for we, we make the detail on which kind of uh, capacity or cooling capacity or something like that to, to uh, manufacture in order to understand that with that equipment and with that capacity, we need to declare our procedure. We need to declare our, our using so uh, easier for it's, 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 it's easy for, for um, uh, our, our department to, to control that and make the, the, the the statistics number for all the equipment and the, the using your NFC we, we, we have in country. Okay, next please. And the other is the one, but so we focus on the importer and the organizer and, uh, and uh, producer. We focus on the, uh, the, the owner with a big capacity, but we also focus on the technician. The technician is very important because we call it the, the directory uh, labor directly uh, uh, resource to uh, approach and to deploy our our regulation or our degree. So the technician requirement is very important. So with Article 28.4 and Article 70, we uh, address some important uh, requirement for the labor and for the technician. And here's a management roadmap. I believe that uh, we all know uh, very well about the roadmap of Vietnam since we have many uh, presentation before. Uh, and uh, 
it's a uh, not much difference. Uh, but it depends on the country, uh, but uh, not much different from other. And here's AFC and SFC and AFC. So number is a slide, so we will uh, skip this step for the lunch. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, the third one is that the output and the impact impact of TA6730. So we summarize in the impact in the five uh, category. The first one is that the successful organized the workshop in this village legal framework auto zone production. We have the workshop on that and were uh, organized in October 2022 in Hanoi. The one is that we successfully organized the workshop on promoting life cycle management in, of pro carbon and energy efficiency in Vietnam in 20, uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2024 in March. Uh, the third one is that we complete a gap analysis of current policy, laws, and regulation on life cycle management of rural carbon. This is an important one in the uh, support of ADB in our policy that we make the, uh, the gap analysis. The, we uh, from we uh, using some part of how to manage the leakage. The leakage is very important to 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 control the emission. So we we are uh, we point out the gaps in policy and the second one is that in this uh, uh, output we uh, extend the um, the product uh, um, um, extend the the, the, uh, the mechanism for 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 uh, for for uh, pro um, uh, production. And this is a very important one we finish. The fourth one is that the uh, partially assist the government of Vietnam to develop the AFC phase down plan. And the last one, the complete study on identified option for advanced technology, as we mentioned in the three uh, stage of the TA. So in here, the uh, two stage we we done very well, but the one go with the one in the the conduct study, uh, we need more resources because conduct study and and much invest on how the the, the the business model can can run on Vietnam we we uh, uh, speed up the process of AFC management we all start from the economy as uh, we uh, 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 participate earlier today is a professor for, uh, with a presentation from uh, ADB okay the next one uh, this uh, also we are recently we received the QC van uh, uh, 76 2023 on the uh, uh, management, the process of management of AFC uh, is not in the output of the, uh, not just the output of the, the, the ADP, but the one that we, we would like to get more support from ADP because this is uh, one of the key process in our country. The synchronized between the sector, the technician sector and destruction and reclaim is one of the smooth connection, good enhance and speed up. Uh, so the make uh, the concrete uh, in the uh, AFC management and reduce and make it possible the, the leakage. And so uh, the more support uh, in ADB uh, and other, and other uh, organizer, organization group could benefit us in, in this uh, management. Okay, so uh, all of that, for after all of this step, we have summarized on the, the final result we, we achieved. Uh, we have the 164 organizers that complete registration for control substance use and declare by Monre. And uh, we have a table that lists uh, all the uh, components from uh, uh, each sector that uh, we, 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 we done uh, so far. And thank you for, uh, for your listening. And I think that uh, the questions uh, uh, have only been answered. And uh, if you have further questions, I'm going to the questions before we wait for the Thank you. Uh, I'm Kansan. Uh, I was uh, director of the Carbon Control of this uh, Environment Ministry. Uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, then now uh, I uh, gathered the uh, Japanese private company uh, to uh, build the uh, carbon connection networks. Then, uh, uh, 
discussion is uh, in this afternoon. Uh, I point uh, two things uh, for uh, common credit. Uh, first, uh, uh, in this uh, condition, uh, we have uh, businessmen uh, should cover by uh, revenue of HFC credit, uh, cover the uh, collection and uh, destruction cost of the ODS. And the uh, second point is uh, when uh, collection business now or uh, destruction business now uh, can uh, receive uh, revenue of credit. Uh, the, uh, our member company <laughs> in Vietnam took trouble uh, because uh, Jason Credit uh, does not uh, issue so far. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we can continue with that one tomorrow. And uh, any other? A uh, question for the countries, maybe? I am uh, Miraj Vitunthian from Minister of Industry, Thailand. Um, regarding Philippine presentation, I'm wondering, have there been any investigation on the import of some refrigerants in 2022? Because you have more than three or four hundred percent increase in R twenty three import, and you have import of one forty three A, which is very high. All the high GWP were import in that year, and some of these chemical cannot be a single uh, chemical cannot be used as a refrigerant. Then, when we compare to other component, it doesn't match. This would also create problem not only for future implementation of KIP one but also for planning for what gonna be a uh, refrigerant that you would have to reclaim or destroy. So maybe you should look into that. Uh, this is very odd. Thank you. Thank you, do you want to? Uh, thank you, sir, I will not put that. So far, I think there was no invest investigation regarding this, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um... Maybe uh, we all could also use the online platform to ask questions from each other and um, also the lunch break. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mirza. Uh, and also, uh, thank you very much for all the uh, presenters and speakers uh, uh, in this morning. So congratulations for the uh, very fruitful um, um, uh, morning session. So uh, we would like to invite all of you to uh, lunch. Uh, please make sure that you pick up lunch coupon um, at the at the entrance or at the exit of this uh, meeting room. And then uh, you go down um, on, uh, to the ground floor, the first floor in this uh, building. And then uh, right next to the building, uh, you, you pass through the um, in front of reception, but there is another uh, uh, building on the first floor. There's a, a lunch uh, venue, so um, please enjoy your lunch. And we're going to start for the uh, the afternoon session as scheduled, one thirty. So please come back. Thank you very much.